This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. A very good afternoon, everybody and everyone, and a very warm welcome also to our Sunset Safari Drive all the way from the Kruger National Park in South Africa and see what we are trying to show you or we're showing you today. How exciting is that to start with a huge male kudu? My name is always David and joined the camera manning, the man manning the camera is Fag. Always. Always fag, and I can say he's one of the best cameramen we got here. And just see why I think he's one of the greatest. And there's a male kudu there trying to cut a female there. And remember, we request all of you to know this is always a very interactive safari. Your questions, your comments, and your feelings make a huge difference so keep tweeting on hashtag safari live and you can always follow us on the youtube chat stream very lucky to start with kudus on a great afternoon with 74 degrees very good with 74 degrees of fahrenheit and 20 oops 23 degrees celsius i don't know why she was running there and i was just telling the male kudu where did the kudu where did the male go we had a, a male somewhere, Fag. Because I want to tell this male, male kudu happy Father's Day, male kudu. See, by telling him that he's trying to mark his territory. And to all of you nice viewers, wherever you are in the world, for those who did not meet me in the morning, I'm telling you very happy Father's Day to the kudu fathers, to the fathers of the spiders, to the fathers of the crocodiles, to the fathers of the snakes, and all the fathers in the wilderness, all over the world happy father's day out with me today we have the gentleman who is doing walk and getting all the trucks rough and we got the beautiful girl taylor makuni out somewhere doing what i'm doing and we're promising you another exciting sunset drive it's majestic kudu walking away you can see how they keep marching in the open area which is our quarantine area as much as their browsers once in a while, you'll get them coming out and eating some little fobs or plants on the ground. And as I said earlier, the beautiful girl Taylor would like to say hello to all of you. Good afternoon. Hello everybody, as David said, my name is Taylor McCurdy and on camera with me today is Greg and we are looking for cheetah cats. Are we going to find, we, I always get that stump, every single time. I don't think I've ever avoided the stump that scurries out on the road. I always drive over it. Anyways, as I said, we are looking for cheetah today and uh, hopefully we're going to find them, seeing as though they've been around for the last two drives, which has been fantastic. Will our luck last till today? I hope so. I really hope so. I've been wanting to see them and then I was, of course, I suppose the cheetah were teasing me by leading me on a wild goose chase yesterday morning and then, well, taunting me with a, a view on foot, which was pretty spectacular. But I do like to watch those youngsters play around and they're very re relaxed around the cars. So let's keep our fingers crossed. They have moved though. They moved, um, I think they, well, I have packed tracks going down Zoe's road that look really fresh on top of the vehicle tracks from this morning. So I assume that they've come this way. Now I'm just trying to figure out where they've gone off. So Herbie and the Bushwalk team have also joined us, hoping to give us a hand. So I'm just going to check this intersection very quickly. Just, just, yeah, I actually want to go check this open area first. Let's quickly do that because there's a nice open area here. I don't see any tracks coming this way. It's actually quite warm. I don't know why I have my jersey on now. It is not a good representation of what the weather is actually like. It's going to have to come off, I'm afraid, at some point. Um, I'm now starting to feel like I'm developing a fever, but that's, of course, because I'm just warming up with this silly jersey on. It's definitely quite difficult trying to track and, and then also spot the animals. It's so difficult. Well, it was quite nice in the Mara where you could just look around <laughs> and scan a bit. 
Thank you, Jason. Um, I, hope, I think that's motivating me to want to find the cheetah. You said, if I find the cheetah, you will kiss me through your iPad. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's very kind. There we go. You can have a kiss back. I don't know if people do that, but there <laughs> Okay. Let us try and find the cheetah cats. Okay, now I've got distracted. Thanks, Jason. Um, okay, we're going to keep looking for the cheetah. Off you go to Ralph to see where he is. Now, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome, welcome to the afternoon bushwalk. And, uh, well, my name is Ralph Kirsten, and we're coming to you live from the Greater Kruger National Park in South Africa. On the camera today, I've got Senzo with me. And please don't forget to send us your questions and your comments on the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and on the YouTube live chat, because we'd love to know what you would like to find out this afternoon about, well, whatever you want out here in the bush. Now, we've decided to just go along and help Taylor to relocate those skunkunk, as we call them here locally, or the cheetah, those three cheetah, because they were seen this morning, but it um, seems like they've moved along a little bit. So we're also going to head in that direction and um, uh, see if we can pick up on any of those fresh tracks and then just point them in the right direction. After that, However, we will then go and see if we can maybe catch up with Tandi and Tlalamba or with Tingana, whatever is sort of the most, um, uh, the, the more productive of the two for us to be able to go and find. And that's in terms of the freshness of tracks and where exactly those two uh, different characters are uh, in terms of where, you know, the, the kind of bush that they're in. So the one that is most realistic to be able to find, we'll go and head there. At the moment, just walking and enjoying this lovely long, um, yellow thatching grass as uh, this grass is used in a lot of the huts and home building here in the area so uh, this would obviously be harvested outside of a national park lots of the ladies go and collect this they also sell it next to the roads and um, obviously the people using that to build their huts with these round rondavel type um, uh, uh, concrete walls with the grass heading up on top so very fascinating now um, let's see, what do you guys want us to look at in terms of the small things as we go along on the walk? You can let us know, please. Bronek, you say you want to see some snakes? I'll try my best to show you some tracks of snakes. But um, at this time of year in winter, not as much activity of snakes than you would get in summer. Because obviously they are ectothermic, as you do know. So um, sometimes it's, uh, we can find them at this time of day, just sunning themselves a little bit. And I'll try my best, as I say, to see if we can find some. Maybe we'll find some lizards as well. Um, a good time of the day for them to be trying to get a bit of warmth and uh, a little bit earlier, we had quite a bit of spattering of rain. So um, it might have cleared up some of the tracks in some of the parts. Um, and at least we'll be able to have a nice timeline to know if um, we've got extremely fresh tracks or not. Because since this morning, obviously, we'll have just a little bit of a, a splashing on the roads and on the sand from the water that, was, that came through. It was just a quick cloud burst, not too much rain uh, altogether. Almost one, one of those winter sort of rain showers, quick, quick, and then it was gone. So you can see still a few rain clouds around, but I think it's pretty much burning off for the moment. So we're just going to continue, I think, heading towards where those cheetah were last seen, and I'm pretty sure that with a bit of luck, we'll be able to find them. Fantastic, and uh, good luck. You've got a job to do there, Ralph, to get a snake for one of our viewers. Eh? Hopefully you get one. And we moved on. We left the kudus, and now we have found a new species of antelopes, young ones, males and females. I've been trying to look specifically for the males and tell them Happy Father's Day, but they're not separating. They're all staying together, and these are the fun bits. The wildebeest having a small mini migration. I'm trying to imagine if they know where their cousins are, who will be moving in the hundreds of thousands in maybe another one or two months in East Africa. There used to be also migration around this area way back. Fantastic. 
Lou from Final Control says that's great light. And of course, all the credit goes to Fag. He's such a team player and does a great job. <laughs> We're going to move forward a little bit. What do you think, Fak? Yeah. And see, because we have seen this uh, we'll be together with Kudus and see whether we can frame them together. You know, we can have one frame and short for two. And we have seen another set of Kudus with their huge horns. We never miss looking on the ground because that's where the trucks will always be. There's a water hole not very far from where we are, and we have noticed animals of different species will be brought together about certain commonalities. Water, food, sometimes safety. So this particular two different species here are being brought at this particular point by water. Let's see, uh, Fagi, let me know where to stop. Exactly. Okay, and this is... Look at that. Dismo, how are you today? And you're asking, can the wild animals catch a flu or a cold? Yes, as you can see that big herd of kudus moving there. They do, they do, depending if they're rained on, definitely. Just like human beings, they are all mammals, and we are all subject to getting infections. Yes, they can, and once in a while we also hear or see animals sneezing, you know. Not once we are watching lions or cheetahs and we just hear a small little sneeze. So yes, they can get cold, they can get fever, they can get infection, sorry about my the bonnet of the car. They can get, you know, even tuberculosis, TBs. We have seen lions eating uh, buffaloes that are infected with some uh, tuberculosis and they get infected also, but somehow they come through. As beautiful kudus are marching there. Not sure this is like a breeding season for them. This one dominant guy there, and he's definitely up to something. Sinak, how are you? And always a pleasure to hear your name and you're asking whether kudus are the strongest antelopes. I think, Sinak, it will depend on how you're looking at it or strong in terms of fighting, strong in terms of, you know, pushing trees. But personally, I think a fully grown kudu sinak of about 500, 600 pounds or 550 pounds, by any standard, they are huge. And if you see two fighting, you can tell if they miss each other on a fight, how they break the trees. So I would say, well, Sinak, they're very strong because one of their defenses, and especially for the males, is fighting. I would say they're quite strong, strong uh, animals and most of the males. You can see baying browsers, how they feed on leaves. They have a little bit of advantage over the other antelopes. They can raise their long necks, not like the giraffes, but they have the advantage of reaching the leaves that are up there. Unlike impalas or the nyalas, the nyalas are also browsers, but they are not as high or as tall as the kudus. So at least to me, the last few weeks, I've seen kudus looking in better shape. They all look in good shape, but the kudus to me look more better. And one of the reasons I would say that is they can reach the top leaves. And you can see oxpakers, as usual, hitchhiking on them and getting all the parasites or the, you know, or the ticks you may be seeing on top of the skudus. Fantastic. Very good. The skudus have done a very good job. And we'll have one more look on some van beasts here. And then, that's good, Fagi, do you want me to move forward? That's good? Yeah. All right. We'll have a look at the van beasts. They've all been feeding together, but, you know, birds of a feather fly together. The kudus, as a species, all of them shifted to the right and they moved and the wildebeest have remained here, showing the differences between those two species, especially when it comes to feeding habits. This one's being more of grazers, but I'm sure they could be getting something different from the grass because as you can see, the grass there looks quite dry, but sometimes they get the rhizomes. The base of the grass will always be holding some nutrition and either the roots they got muscles on the on the mouth. They can be able to uproot a little root or plants down there. Rhonda, you're wondering about the dryness of the grass. Now, we are going through winter here now, and maybe for the next two months, Rhonda, we will not get any rains. And we hope to get rains anytime, maybe end of 
I would say, I forgot to think, end of July or end of August? Uh, towards the end of August. Yeah. yeah. Very good. So far things towards the end of August, September is when we expect the rains to come and everything here will turn around and will be green. But that notwithstanding, the animals have always adapted and you can see that is very good looking vulnerabilities to their wonder and, you know, very healthy. They'll always know how to substitute when the grass is not available. They'll always know what to substitute and feed on. Pretty small heart compared to the hearts that do migration and how fantastic. And every species I'll be seeing today before I leave them, I leave them by saying, as Raf is looking at a tree, I leave them by saying, Happy Father's Day. And let's find out if Raf is telling trees Happy Father's Day. Well, that's it, Rafiki Dave. Yes, happy Father's Day to everybody around. Uh, I know, I think it's only in South Africa that it's Father's Day, because isn't it that uh, different countries have different days for Father's Day? Anyway, it's Father's Day in South Africa now, so happy Father's Day from me to all those fathers out there, to my father. And, uh, well, here we go. We're standing here next to a silver uh, cluster leaf. Oh, Lou tells me it's Father's Day worldwide. I do know that with Mother's Day, there's a couple of different days around the world, not um, international. Now, these little balls that we're seeing from the silver cluster leaf, I'm sure um, lots of people do know what they are, uh, or any regular viewers. I'm sure this has been covered a few times. But for anybody that doesn't know, first and foremost, obviously the plant being called the silver cluster leaf, Terminalia cirrus. And um, it's a very uh, characteristic tree that we do get. And why it's called a silver cluster leaf is because of that sheen on the back, uh, a hairy color, uh, giving it a silver coloration on the back of the leaves. And cluster leaf, because all the leaves are sort of uh, clustered up on the terminal bud on the end of branches. Now, that's not the reason why I stopped here. It's because uh, these trees are quite characteristic that they get stung by gall wasps. And the, the little wasp then actually injects a growth hormone into the, into the branches. Now, I've, I've pulled one off an old one, but I, sh I want to show you one just on the plant itself. There it is there. So the little, and that's quite a big one. The wasp will sting the branch and then it grows into this bulb type structure and um, it lays its eggs on the inside there and then those eggs will hatch obviously and pupate into the wasp which later you will see these little holes that they actually make their exit now I just took this one off because I just wanted to pop it open and we have a look on the inside and well there we go there's like that little pupa type thing um, and this one has sorry i'm just trying to get it out there so that's exactly the type of little um pupa balls and gall um, uh, structures that are created by these uh, little gall wasps and then from there on they would obviously be coming out so very characteristic of the silver cluster leaf and well we see that quite a lot um and some of the acacias we can actually get where they sting the thorns, but that is more down to little ants. They will sting the thorns, and then those um, acacia, uh, well now some of them being virtilia, um, those thorns will actually swell up, like the branches down here on the silver cluster leaf, and then the ants actually having their little nests on the inside there. So obviously this time of year we try to look for all these kind of little things, um, uh, but very much dormant part for the arthropods and very quiet actually indeed because you know in summer you can walk along and under every single piece of bark or stone that you pick up there's something there something alive and it's really noticeable at this time of year how quiet it gets on that front um, and you can also feel the pure dryness of the vegetation as you're walking through it now at the moment as well now, Gary, um, for me, the ticks aren't a problem at all in the winter time. Uh, I've had little to no bites at, uh, at, at this particular time. But um, some of the guides have said there is the odd one. So I would say that there's a definite uh, a reduction in the amount of ticks that we do have at this time. But they're, they're not completely gone. Um, but they're very little around, I must say. So 
They're also probably pretty dormant in their egg phase now. Little uh, eggs in the surface of the soil waiting for that first little bit of rain. Like a lot of the other um, arthropods and arachnids um, waiting for just that summer or spring months to come about once more. And that's when um, uh, obviously the ground then just comes to life all over again and it becomes fascinating with the amount of life that you actually find all around so looking for those little animals here and there but um, with the ultimate goal of heading towards where the cheetah were and finding those tracks and i wonder how it's going with taylor and those cheetah Not so great. Um, we're trying to find them. I don't know where they've gone. So I think I'm pretty sure I had cheetah tracks on Triple M, which is one of the boundary roads. Some of them look really old though, but I'm, I'm confused because the cheetah haven't sort of been around for quite some time and come back this way. And then there were some that looked really fresh. So I'm in two minds. I'm just sort of checking some open areas. We just checked Sandy Patch now. I couldn't see anything. I haven't seen any more tracks. I'm just having a look. I mean, I could have been wrong. There were also female leopard tracks that looked like they were there from this morning a bit further down on the road, crossing into Simbambili. So I don't know who may have been walking around there, which female. Um, and I did see someone had marked them. It definitely looked like from this morning. So what I think I might do is now we, we're just sort of, um, I suppose, doing a little perimeter patrol, hoping to pick up on some decent tracks of uh, the cheetah. I think we are... We're going to go to Sydney's Dam, which is that way, and then once we get to Sydney's Dam, I'm just checking, we uh, will just scan that area, have a little look. There's water there, it's nice and open. There's often a pile of this, could be food around. Those cheetah look like they do need to feed. I don't know. Or they could have gone back west because there are lots of open areas there and they have been enjoying their time. So I'm not really sure. Ah, and uh, well. Speaking of Impala being tasty treats, it seems as though David has got some. Well, good luck, Taylor, and hopefully you'll find those tutors. They entertained us very well last night with Fug, and also these mornings after all the mishaps. But uh, yeah, they may have something here they may want to eat. And look at those beautiful Impalas. Chewing cut, being ruminants. Now, because of the heat of the day, the little tent will slow down. And this is one of the advantages of ruminants. From all what they ate earlier, they can slow down, regurgitate it, and then keep rechewing it, then swallow it. This particular one we see here must be very busy doing that. And again, depending on how much they had eaten, the one behind it doesn't look very, you know, hungry or like it had enough to eat. It has regurgitated enough and just pushed a knot that just swallowed. Boop. How nice is that? Was chewing, reach you, and then swallow. Because the temperatures are pretty high, I would say. You can see from the amount of light they got there, it's a bit warm. So just slow down and start getting a little bit busier at dusk or an hour to six o'clock. So all of them will tend to slow down, enjoy some nice shade, and just regurgitate some of them laying down there. And it has been claimed some of the ruminants could just be laying down there and they could half sleep. Half of the brain could be sleeping and the other half not. Another plus for being a ruminant, unlike being a non-ruminant. So you're able to rest, have a nap, as you, you know, reach you your food, then rest the other side of the brain. Mate, very good comment. You see, they're so focused on chewing. And yes, when you look at them, it's just like how, I don't know if you've seen kids, especially in the village they come from, any time I would visit, the first thing the kids would tell me, I would tell them, you know, I have so many goodies for you. And they'll tell them, you know what, I brought you fruit, I brought you bread, I brought you some cupcakes, I brought you some gum. They'll tell me, stop there, gum, gum, chewing gum, chewing gum. And you'd see those kids, you know, Fug's just laughing, eh? You'd see those kids, Chewing, <laughs> chewing gum, you know, it's just like this impala. It just remind me, reminds me of the kids in my village. 
And yes, they're so focused, I agree with you, on you know, just rechewing their food. Because it's a bit softer than when they first, you know, swallowed it. So it goes through all the four chambers in their stomachs. So when it comes back, it has gone through a bit of uh, bacteria that have softened a bit. And I think it usually tastes a little different and maybe tastier. So they tend to think they're eating different food. Maybe it's like how we eat our main course and then we have a dessert. And the desserts always tend to be uh, the best parts of a meal. What do you think, Fag? Yeah, Fag says yes. You're allowed to eat as unless you're finished. <laughs> yeah, and Fag says they shouldn't be allowed to eat until the veggies are finished. And I hope these impalas have just done that. They have finished their veggies, and that's how now they are enjoying that part. And you might notice they might continue, you know, regurgitating and rechewing the food a lot longer than the time they would spend eating. Just because they said it tastes a little better. You might hear a little plane from the ground, from the air flying. <laughs> Gary, how are you? And that's a good question. And you're asking, do they always chew in one direction? And I think you're giving me some homework to watch this particular one because it's like going in one direction. And I'm thinking, how do I chew my food myself? And if I know how I chew, I should know how the impalas chew. What Fag you need to do is you show us a different impala chewing. You've got some work to do and we find out is it chewing this way. Can you say this is chewing anticlockwise? Let's see if we get another one. Yeah, it's also chewing anticlockwise, right? It's like moving the lower mandible to the left. To my thinking, that's anti-clockwise, maybe two more. And then if that should be the case, Gary, we can say they move the lower mandible. Yes, like anti-clockwise. It seems so. And I'm not sure to say either they are left-handed or right-handed, and that's how they move, you know, their mouth, and especially the lower part, because it's only the lower one that's moving. And the top one, where the nose, are, where the, the nose is, is not moving at all. But that's one of the most interesting questions I've ever had and have never looked carefully and thought when they chew, how do they move their mouth? I'll be think, I think I'll be looking myself, you know, in the mirror tonight when I'll be having dinner, maybe me and Fag, and we'll find out how we chew our food, maybe eat separately Fag, and then we compare notes. I don't know, human beings, how we also eat. But if you look at these two, they're chewing in the same direction. So it's either left to right or right to left and they're facing the other way is difficult to know but most important it's the lower part that moves and not the upper mandible something got their attention there and as much as they slow down when you know they ruminate they never want to take any chances because they know the predators can take that advantage and sneak on them very quietly Eagle sprout, good question. Do antelopes have more than one set of teeth? Uh, no, they only have one set and that's it. And the only animals I think that might have more than one set of teeth are the ellies. The elephants, I think or I guess they got six sets of teeth, but all antelopes I know of, once they lose the teeth and just like we human beings, once we lose our permanent teeth, unless we go and do some dentures or do some dental work, that's it. You lose all your teeth. We have seen a few animals, especially buffaloes, when they age up and not you know, missing so many teeth. So antelopes, I think, will always have one set of teeth and that's it. Other animals I might be thinking of are the crocodiles. The crocodiles have been known once they have their teeth, once they turn where, they are able to replace their teeth and have a new set. I do not know how many sets they end up having, but crocs will have, if one particular tooth is broken or is worn out, it is replaced by another one popping up from top bottom. But Ellie's, we know before they die, they'll have about six sets of teeth in their life and their teeth tend to grow backwards, forwards, and for the antelopes is upwards, downwards, and downwards, upwards, just like us human beings. 
Remember, to all of you nice viewers asking questions is always very healthy for us because what we do here is a very interactive, uh, interactive game drive. And, you know, with your questions and comments and your feelings, you make us feel alive because we only see you through the lens. And Raf is still tracking. Well, we are tracking and we're also just looking at any of the little arthropods that are active at the moment. Um, and I just want to do a little check just to see if this little antline larva over here, and Senzo is saying wait for him, I just want to see. With these little conical pit traps, obviously that, that little antline larva is waiting at the bottom for a little ant just to walk along the edge like I'm just pretending here. And I'm not going to destroy his little conical pit. I just want to see if he's actually at home. And if he is, he'll be throwing the sand up just uh, to try and knock. There he is. You see that? Uh, he's knocking the sand up in an attempt to knock the little ant down that I'm just pretending to be. So he's at the bottom there. And sometimes if I'm talking like this, he might actually realize that I'm here. And then he might go quiet. But let's just see. I can see his little pincers in the bottom of the pit there. So let's just scratch a tiny little bit more sand. There, he throws it back up again. You see that? There we go. That's very cool. Okay, I won't disturb him too much. Um, but, you know, I, I've said this many times, but uh, once again, for any new viewers, that's the little larva of a lacewing or the adult antlion. And what he's doing there is he's sitting there in the bottom waiting for unsuspecting ants or little insects to come walking along. And they throw that sand up like that. And once they knock them down to the bottom, that with those two pincers that he's using to throw the sand, he'll grab onto that little insect and pull it down. And those pincers are actually hollow and they've got little needles on the end. So they pierce whatever it is, whether it's an ant or whatever, and then through those hollow uh, sort of syringe-like pincers, they will then be um, sucking all the juices out of them. And are you coming in? Oh, the next one. Sorry, let's check that one. This one over here. Oh, there we go. See that? So then they'll suck all the juices out and then um, just take it a little bit further down. There, this one's also a little bit active. And they normally get active when it gets a bit hot in the middle of the day as well. So you can see just from the soil around it that it's actually quite active because it's been kept nice and clean. There's another smaller one here. Just see if he's... If he's willing to play along. Not always. Oh, that one just started kicking some sand up, doing some maintenance there again. Um, and you know what? It's actually I incredible because uh, in this phase, they can actually stay in the lava phase for up to 10 years. And that is absolutely sensational for such a little creature to live for so long. And what happens then is they obviously metamorphosize into the adult lacewing. And when they're at that stage, they don't have a mouth. They don't have mouth parts, so they can't even eat. So what they will do is they will defecate once, they will mate, and they will die. And it can happen in two to three days. So up to 10 years in the larval phase, but up to possibly a maximum of about three days in the adult and it's all done. So once they do get to that phase, the lay swing, they're actually re really pretty, but it doesn't last for long. So one of those uh, quite interesting little life cycles of the, of the ant line. Now, Ash, uh, obviously I've been, uh, you know, moving around uh, and, and guiding uh, and being in the wilderness for now 20 years uh, since I started studying or since I finished high school. Um, so, well, it's taken all of that time um, to be able to have such a, you know, a, a, well, not a, a bigger set of experience of all these different creatures. But um, I still, you know, I don't profess to know anything anywhere near uh, all the stuff that's out here in the bush. And it's nice to find new things every time you go out and then try and identify them. And those are the ones that you always remember, the, where you put the most effort into actually finding out what it is. So when it's something that's out of the order, Ordinary. That's actually the best and easiest way for you to remember once you eventually find out what it is and uh, especially the interesting stuff as well. So that's what we're always looking for when we're walking. Um, you know, anything out of the ordinary, anything different that we can have a look at and debate and maybe possibly identify as well. 
and and then uh, and then we learn as we go along. And what have we got here? Looks like an old. That's just an old African giant land snail shell. I wonder, that would be quite interesting for a hermit crab to use one of those as his shell. It could get quite big in that. But there's also lots of activity of rodents. And I was talking about it a little while ago because we saw a lot of owl tracks on the road. And these are the type of little holes that these um, four-toed elephant shrews and uh, little gerbils and mice and even rats that will use these little tunnels. Um, and they actually get quite a little highway as well, moving through the grass, which uh, they make fantastic pathways through here, and they obviously run up and down through them. Now, speaking of pathways and uh, highways, let's go on over to Dave. I think he's driving around. Yes, and uh, leopards will also eat rodents. And talking of leopards and rodents, I'm talking of uh, seeing Hornbill. Hornbill. Do you want a photo? No. Sorry, Rob. No, he's gone, Dave. He's gone. Don't worry. There's a red bill hornbill there. And we are talking or talking of the leopards. And my plans today are to see if I would see any leopard. And not any. With a choice between Tandi and Tingana, I would prefer Tingana being a male so that I can tell him Happy Father's Day. So I'm sure he has fathered a number of cubs around this area. I don't know how many cubs he has fathered. He has done a pretty job. And hopefully he will continue for, three, you know, getting more cubs. He's about 12 years old. He's a leopard around this area. So at 12, he has done very well. I would be more than happy if we could see a few more cubs from him. So that's my main plan today. Hopefully I don't. This is my signal at this point. This is one area that Tandy loves to come. We saw her here the other day with a kill. But what we have today is a Nyala. Let's see if the Nyala will stay because, because the Nyala is a male. And Fag, let me know at what point you want me to tell. Okay, I'm just stopping Nyala. Thank you for looking at me because I want to tell you Happy Father's Day. Sorry, Fag. And that's a big bull yala, and I'm sure he's aware today's Father's Day and feeding on his own. And again, just like the kudus we saw before, these are browsers, and you can tell that's maybe the highest he can eat in terms of reaching on the top leaves as a browser. But the kudus we saw earlier had much longer necks, and they would go further looking or getting leaves that are full of moisture and maybe much younger leaves or twigs from the trees turns around so want to make a move church noah you're asking whether we have any okapis located in this region not really church noah okapis i'm sure you know they look like half giraffe half zebra they nearest one I would say from here would be like uh, some thousands of miles away in a country called DRC Congo or Democratic Republic of Congo in Zaire, they used to call it Zaire before. That's where you could see Okapis, not very many left, but not any that I know in this region uh, of South Africa or in East Africa. The only place I would maybe guarantee if you're lucky to see them would be the DRC. That's where you'd see the Okapis. And they have been, you know, red listed by the IUCN now because, you know, they have been poached a lot because of the beautiful skin and the IUCN have, you know, red listed them. And hopefully we are looking at the numbers growing and getting big in future and for people to be able to see them. Not sure if they would survive here because uh, they tend to stay in more thicket, big forest, high grounds and that you'll have lots of rain and possibly all around the year and maybe not survive like the Nyala we got here. The only commonality I would say between the two are the little stripes you see here, but these stripes are much thinner on this Nyala bull than you'd see in an Okapi. So when they don't reach the top leaves, they'll be digging some roots or some small forbs or plants from the ground and being browsers, they will not be grazing at all. Seldom you see them, you know, grazing, but it's quite, quite rare. 
they'll always be browsing. But now what you can see it doing there is to dig some rhizomes or any roots from the grass and then moving closer to that shaded area where it can eat and get some nice shade. Curse Spider, you're asking me whether I have seen Anyala dance or Dominance, uh, you know, play by the two boots. I have not, and that's one thing I'm really looking forward to see. I've always seen it on documentaries, but of course, when my colleagues have been out on game drives on Safari Live, I've seen them do it. I've seen, you know, James Henry, Taylor, Tristan, uh, you know, all of them, and... Rough, personally, I have not seen, but I would be more than happy to see a display of mail because I think it is something very exciting. When I'm saying that, I would want also to imitate it as they do it, how they make themselves big and turning around, but more seeing more of the fight than the display of dominance. If I would be lucky to see three, four of them together, that would be exciting and see maybe we can read them and do a poll on who will do better than the other. You can see the tip, you know, on the end of the horns, like ivory. And as they get bigger, it always shows a bit of maturity. And to see him alone there shows how mature, how he, you know, how an old he is. Fantastic. Looking very clean, Yala. There's someone who doesn't want to look very clean. Now, everyone, I'm just looking at a little bit of a crime scene here because there seems to be a little birdie that has been eaten just, well, he's definitely been plucked, just at the, um, at the entrance to, a, to an art fork burrow as well. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure what else would have been using it there, but you can see all of these feathers here. Lots of white dots, well, white with brown dots. Now, why don't we see, what do you guys think? What bird was this? Let's lay out the, I'm just going to put it here, Senzo, because I want to get out some of the other ones as well. These are the characteristic colors that we've got here. There's another one. So, something with brown and black sort of stripes like that. But also, this looks like the belly part or the down feathers in softer areas. And they sort of got a white with a black stripe on it. Very fluffy here. This probably mostly due to the, uh, from the chest area of the bird. And you see there all these colors. So why don't you guys send through? What do you think? What bird is this? Anybody know? Let's get the answers in there and see what you guys think. Um, and then we can also see um, what do you think ate it. I'm going to start just to uh, speak what I think might have eaten it. Um, I think this, it couldn't be a mongoose, um, something like a little mongoose. It would obviously have been eaten on the ground here, and I'm wondering if this stick was used as a perch site, or if it was just sort of uh, attacked into this little corner here, and, and this is where the, it started to pluck the feathers. I don't see any fresh tracks of anything around here. You know, slender mongoose would be an ideal kind of candidate, uh, but then we could also have any of the, the bird-eating raptors as well, um, even down to the little pearl-spotted owlets. They also kill little birds and eat them. Um, the sparrow hawks, the African goshawk, um, what else? Could be even a little jackal. Now, Christina, I don't think that's a crested barbet, no. Because a crested barbet's got lots of yellow and green and very almost uh, illuminous colors. Where you see this is very indicative light brown with black and then a little bit of white with dark brown to black. That's all in the greater part of these feathers here. See that? There's quite indicative colors here. Uh, Ned, yeah, it is a bird that is clearly missing some feathers. I would say I uh, think that's probably the least of this little bird's problems because I'm pretty sure it's already been digested by whatever ingested it. And there's lots of feathers around. But a very, oh, that's quite a pretty one there. 
Coast Cider. Um, I suppose it could have been a Franklin. Uh, I would probably think one of the smaller ones, like a Cokey Franklin. That is that is an option. Um, Cokey Franklin is a... Oh, here's another nice colour there. Another nice big feather. There it is there. Oopsie. So, see these, these colours. These colours are very characteristic here. Pretty sure. You know, I don't know the, the exact answer. I'm just also going to, you know, think maybe maybe a little quail. Maybe a little button quail. These feathers are rather small. So, and these look like these are possibly wing feathers um, or tail feathers. Those ones there. So, a very, it's a small little bird, whatever it is. And I would say a little button quail or like you say, maybe a cokey franklin. They are quite small as well. The other ones that possibly could also be maybe something like a nightjar um, but you guys with your screenshots and so on you might be able to take a little picture of those um, uh, uh, feathers and maybe be able to match them up with a different bird or two I'm not exactly sure but it's one of these sort of browny black colored birds a small little bird as well and um, I, w I would think that it's some kind of nocturnal bird or raptor that's uh, actually nailed it here as well Simon, yeah, you could be right as well. Maybe it was a, bar, uh, a grass owl. Um, that uh, Any of the little owls that fly around here at night as well, and I'm sure that they could have got themselves a little quail or um, uh, the, one of the night jars, etc. But there's a lot of feathers, as I say, and very characteristic colors there. Anyway, that's a mystery for now, but let's see what information you guys can come up with. Otherwise, I'll have a look also when I get back uh, to camp in my bird book. Uh, just those exact colors there um, is quite characteristic. So anyway, that's very interesting. As I say, stopping along the way for anything interesting like that. We are still making our way uh, towards where those cheetah were last seen this morning. But... Um, these little things always interest me, and especially a crime scene or something that we don't know exactly what has happened, and we try and work out the mystery. So the, uh, see, the search for the cheetah seems to be continuing, and that's exactly what we're going to do now. For sure. Luckily, Craig is quick on his hands there. <laughs> Goodness. Um, we've got one horn, Sean. But he's going to walk out of frame in a second, or maybe he'll just stand there very nicely for us. Hello. Well, that's, of course, an injury. Well, snapped horn from fighting with the other Impala. I don't know when he did that, though. It's kind of hard to see. Doesn't look, does it look new? Nah. Maybe. It's very difficult to tell. That must have given him a little bit of a headache. But I've never seen an Impala die from a... Chopped off horn. Now you're really dangerous, hey? Now, oh, next year. Goodness gracious, he's going to be a really, really good contender. Bye bye, one on Sean. Like a knife, like a sword now. Okay, so the cheetah have. Uh, I think they've crossed west. I think they've moved off of the property. Because I had some trucks and then I was going back to go and look at them again, and then unfortunately, a ginormous truck drove straight over all of the tracks that I'd marked and I was saying no and then another car just in case the truck didn't get them came the opposite way and since Craig and I have gone up and down there we've just been seeing cars um, it's a boundary road of course and one of the roads that all the delivery vehicles and things use so it's normal you don't normally get to see many tracks there unless you can beat the the traffic in the early morning so now I think we shall not look for cats we're going to look for everything else and then maybe some cats will appear. I would like to see wild dog at some point. That could be quite cool. Maybe they'll be around. But I'm still just checking. Just checking around here. Maybe we missed those cheetah. Maybe they walked on Triple M and then came back this way. Because they were coming north and then they've changed their direction and gone west. Hmm. Very interesting. I don't know where they are. So maybe some giraffe, maybe some elephants, maybe some zebra or wildebeest will be quite nice. Probably try to do a little bit of birding if we see a decent uh, bird party. And I think that's what we've got sort of planned. And then I'm looking forward to this evening for some nocturnal critters. 
Alicia, it does get quite chilly. It's um, it's not too bad. Last night wasn't the coldest, uh, but we have had a couple of sort of chilly days. Now that these clouds have disappeared, maybe we'll we'll get some more chilly evenings. It it kind of it kind of drops from about 18 degrees just as the sun goes down. And this is this is degrees Celsius, of course, and then. Only by the time we've woken up in the morning, it's anywhere between about 8 and 12 degrees, somewhere around there. So this morning must have been about 15 or 16 degrees Celsius. So that's not what's cold. It's once you start driving that it becomes really, really chilly because there is a little bit of a nip in the air at the moment. But a bit of frost. No, not that there's actual frost or anything down on, any, on the ground or any of the vegetation. But it does, it does make you quite cold. There's some Franklins that are making noises here. Let's see what they're making noises about. Why are you lying? I'm trying to see where... Oh, we won't get it. We're not going to get a clean view. We're going to get an abstracted view, I'm afraid. Huh. There's a family of Natal spur files and little ones. Can you see the chicks running through? There you are. So that's why there's so many of them. There's I think I saw about three or four just running off. Young young chicks. Maybe that's what they were clucking about. Maybe they were getting a little bit too far. They were all up on this up on the tree that was just to the right of us, just sitting up there. So I didn't think it was necessarily anything. Ah. Oh. Now there was chatter at breakfast today about um, solving the mystery of where Scuba Steve has gone and I think David has already solved it. Yes, uh, Taylor, you should not panic, as we all worried when we missed our goslings. And now, Scuba Steve has not only resurfaced from the water, but he has resurfaced to his usual home, to his usual position. We just came here because for two or three days he has been missing in action. And the last person to be here, well, he also went under, but after a few minutes or a few seconds, he's going to resurface again, which is very typical of hippos. And the last person here was Steve, and Steve came back to the camp and told us he's a bit worried that Scuba Steve has gone missing. And we thought, did he go to Russia to watch some football? Maybe not. Or if he did, he thought the African teams were not doing very well, and this morning he caught a direct flight back to South Africa. <laughs> and we have always debated how long will Hippo stay under the water before breathing. I think that was just slightly under one minute. Scuba Steve, did you breathe or did you just come out to look? And we'll always tell when they breathe, sometimes they just blow water out of their noses and look at him just keeping an eye on us. How are you doing? Where had you gone, Scuba Steve? I'm trying to imagine the nearest water holes from here because hippos cannot stay out of water for more than five hours, especially during the day, unless they stay under some very, you know, good thickets where they'll have good cover and protecting the very sensitive skin from the sun. I would just wonder where he had gone, honestly. I'm thinking of Cheeto water hole. I do not think so. That is one area that is occupied. Good job there, Fag. You can get him. He's getting a little sleepy. What do you think? He wants to have a nap. So what is to do? The eyes are in, but the ears are out. So he has a choice of listening to us without looking at us. And then he goes, let me go down and... Oh, thank you very much. And uh, Lou in the final control thinks uh, he likes the sound of my voice. Thank you, Lou. Maybe, hopefully, if that's the case, fine. And Scuba Steve, just know we are here. Do you see any terrapins on the other end of the water hole? They've gone in, eh? We had been watching some terrapins there that have been sunning themselves, doing a bit of sunbathing. And once they sense or they think something could go wrong, they'll very quickly go back to the water. Fantastic. Good news. We got our scuba. Oh, yeah, there he is again. One more look at him. Like on pictures, you're asking what happened to those goslings and the geese. And I think we might be going to the third week now, if I'm not wrong. And nobody knows for a fact what transpired. We have had so many theories, 
but personally my guess is they relocated to another town I mean you know they relocated to another waterhole because they're just too young to be on their own and you know until maybe they could be about six eight months for them to start living separately I just think they went to a different waterhole and we also had a theory of predation and maybe we thought some eagles or some leopards could have gotten them but it's not easy to lose seven goslings together plus their parents so we just think personally I think they just went to another area and hopefully we shall know where they are or they'll be seen at one point very good some blacksmith lapwings there well done thug so blacksmith lap lapwings so you'll see them they're very aquatic birds sometimes they are also terrestrial you'll see them close to water and sometimes away from water and like most lapwings They'll keep looking for food for anything aquatic on the water surface or on the edge of the water. And occasionally they'll be roosting or having nests not far from such an area. Very monogamous uh, lapwings. Actually, that's a very good question. Why is he on his own? We named him Scuba Steve, and we have always been wondering why has he been living alone? But you see, hippos are very dominant, and in the hierarchy, if he has not been able to establish, you know, some females with himself, he ends up being, you know, living alone. But the question has been, when he leaves this particular waterhole, where does he go? Because we have not spotted him in any other waterhole. For us, either he's smallish, or he's not strong enough to establish his own territory and have some ladies with himself. That's my only guess. Or he could be having some health issues that we do not know. And he has been enjoying this place, maybe hoping one day some ladies will come around, which is rather difficult because the males with the ladies will always skip their females. So, Scuba Steve, as you breathe, blowing air out there, we would wonder and ask you, why do you live alone? Occasionally we have seen two other males, I mean two other hippos here. Not sure they are females or males, but totaling to three and then the two tend to disappear. And Scuba Steve has always remained alone. But that should be a very important question to know why he has always remained alone. And when he leaves the water, where does he normally go? Very good, Scuba Steve, we let you enjoy your afternoon. And please, viewers, remember your questions are always very welcome on hashtag Safari Live. Keep tweeting us anything you want to know about the hippo as you see him blowing some air there, opening the eye and closing. And this is one of the animals we don't take chances with in Africa. Anytime you meet a hippo out of the water, you should consider taking any measure to take care of yourself. Otherwise, they have been known to kill so many people in Africa, together with the buffaloes. But like the village you come from, we have seen more damage and deaths caused by hippos. The trucking team continues doing a good job. Well, um, it seems like there's a few people that think that that crime scene or that little birdie that had been uh, plucked and probably eaten, you guys think maybe an African hoopoo? That's not a bad choice. I, I wonder if those feathers will fit the exact pattern of, of, a, of an African hoopoo. It seems similar colors, but I don't think that they the quite pattern would match, but I stand corrected. Anyway, um, I've just stopped next to a red bush willow, obviously, uh, because these are one of the plants that are seeding at the moment and fruiting, um, and you can see very nicely, this is the red bu bush willow, Combretum apiculatum, and always with Combretum, you have these four-winged seed pods like that, and very indicative of a combretum or bush willow. We've just walked past another one which has got um, uh, very similar seeds, uh, seeds, very similar size as well, but just a slightly different color to them. That's a russet bush willow, and you can see why they call it russet, because it almost looks exactly like rust. That's how I always uh, remembered it. I know russet also the color, but slightly different in the, in the size of the tree and the leaves, but almost identical in their seed 
pods. And obviously they're both fruiting now at the moment and does make for beautiful colors out here in the bush at the moment too. Now they're not the only one that are seeding. We've got lots of the grass that are seeding as well. And this one in particular is one of my favorite grasses the blue seed grass if you have a look nice and closely there you, it's, it's just uh, blowing in the wind a bit you can see why they call it blue seed grass with that slight blue tinge on the end of the seeds and well they are one of the nicer ones that are seeding at the moment but uh, it seems to be coming to an end with the grasses the seeding process i mean um, and as we head into um, full winter and then into spring obviously that whole cycle is going to start repeating itself now we seem to have got information from taylor um, that the cheetah search is possibly over because they might have crossed to the west we're going to go and confirm that and uh, just see uh, if we don't pick up some uh, fresh tracks moving back onto the property. Who knows? They might have gone out, but they could already be back on. Or maybe they didn't go out in the first place. We just want to confirm that. And uh, if we can then, then uh, we'll try and find them. Alternatively, we'll just keep on walking nice and slowly and seeing whatever we can find along these nice, well-worn game paths. Because there's always something to be found. We're looking under all the little logs and so on where we might find some scorpions or anything just hiding up. Now Zach, these um, these uh, bush willows, their, their major protection I would say is in the hardness of the wood. You won't particularly find elephants in that breaking off entire branches, um, big ones anyway. They do take the smaller ones. And what elephants will eat on a bush willow um, branch is just literally the bark. So they, they do roll these around in their mouths and, and, and sort of feeding on this bark. But then the rest of the wood is very, very hard. So... It's pretty well protected against wood borers and, um, and termites, etc. Uh, is the red bush willow, one of the best firewoods around. And the rest of the bush willow is also a very nice hard wood. Um, but the animals do browse on it a little bit. And I suppose it's just down to a little bit of chemical warfare um, with some of the animals. But they do make their um, leaves a little bit more bitter if they've been fed on quite a lot, as do a lot of the um, the, the, the trees and that, uh, as soon as they start getting fed on a little bit, they do then pump some chemicals into the leaves, making them bitter. So, as I say, just walking along on this beautiful winter's afternoon, seeing and stopping for whatever we can find, and we're just going to continue on doing that. Wonderful, wonderful. I hope you enjoy it. So I got really excited now. I was like, ooh, cheetah tracks. And then had forgotten what road I was on and thought, well, maybe they've made a, a return. But um, it isn't. It's the ones when they walked from the repeater to Zoe's road. So that one's their tracks. There's a couple going around here. But um, I, think, I think this was still from earlier this morning when they were moving around a little bit. Hmm, let's go that way. Sorry, I'm changing my mind. I'm very, very indecisive today, which is a problem when you're on a safari. Decisiveness is, oopsie, is not great. Wait, over the bumps. Yeah, the sheep are walking up and down, but I don't know, I don't think these are as fresh as the ones that I had seen a little while ago. Uh, so yeah, and Taxon is also convinced, Taxon is a guide from Juma, that uh, they have cross ways. But we'll just keep checking. We'll go back down all the way and uh, we'll just check sort of towards Treehouse Dam. Like I said, if we get to see some elephants and things along the way, that would be really, really quite nice. We might have to go and try and find that herd of elephants that we were with this morning, but they were feeding in a drainage line, but knowing how quickly elephants can move to, they could have also crossed to the east. They could have gone towards Torchwood. So from here, we'll slowly start making our way that side. And then maybe a little bit later, we'll pop into Chitwa. I'm trying to get an update from that side to see if there's anything happening. Uh, so yeah, so that's sort of our plan. 
But it's quiet again. Again, the cats evade me. They just let me see them on foot. And then in the car, not allowed to see them in the vehicle, apparently. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, maybe we might have to do a bit of birding, too. There isn't much out this afternoon, which I'm surprised by, because it is such a beautiful afternoon, as Ralph sort of pointed out. It's it's really stunning. It's not too hot. It was hot at one point, and then the clouds came over, and now it's actually the perfect temperature to have a jacket on or jersey on. Craig's got his big jacket on already. So I think it's going to turn into a chilly night. Squirrel! Why did you run in front of my car like that? He's just there. He jumps. Let's see if he's going to come out. He's just to the right. Squirrel, 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 squirrel. I don't know how you would call a squirrel. And of course, cheese don't call the animals, especially a cheetah or something. Like, it's one thing us playing around with the little animals. They just look at us and they go, no, and then they run away anyways. But, well, that was a squirrel. But my favorite, my favorite thing in the whole wide world, and I think it's every, every guide's pet hate, is when people call the animals, when they go to a lion. What are you going to do? Imagine that lion goes, ooh, okay. So excited, you know, like get up and like run to the car and go, yes. Or is another one. I promise you, I have tried because obviously I need to test the theory. I've tried to make every sound next to a lion, next to a leopard, once in my life. It doesn't work. It doesn't get them to look at you unless it's an exceptionally skittish animal, but why would you wouldn't really want to be tormenting a very nervous animal? You want to be quiet and trying to get them used to the vehicles initially. You don't start off with strange sounds when you habituate animals. I mean, even turn the radios down at, uh, to a point and then introduce loud blaring radios that can be experienced, you know, uh, when you're on sightings with other safari guides. So I've tried it. It doesn't work. There's no need to do it. I'm doing this for all the safari guides out there. They'll thank me later. <laughs> but it is really, really funny. Because, I mean, I suppose, especially when you're looking at a lion or something, that's, you know, it just look like cats. And, of course, why wouldn't you want to try and call the animals? But they don't know. They haven't been trained, so they don't even know what you're trying to do to them or what, what the purpose is of making those sounds. They probably think humans are weird. Craig and I were chatting just now, and we wondered if animals log human sightings. Like, I wonder if the cheetah went, oh, we had another encounter with people. We thought it was going to be quite dangerous, but it turned out okay. I wonder if they do that as well. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Of course they don't. We have to log all our walks, which we should be. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And he was saying now, who's directing, just went, do you think they ever get excited and go, ooh, a human with blonde hair, that's a rare sighting? You know, things like that. You know, I wonder. One day, I'll ask all the animals these questions when I get superpowers to talk to them. I think I need to get bitten by a, what, a nuclear spider, nuclear active, or radioactive spider, sorry, or something like that. But I don't want to be shooting webs. Don't want to be doing that. Although that could be quite fun. I can't imagine it would be very useful for my job. But if I could speak to the animals, hey, that would be amazing. I may even choose speaking to the animals over flying if I was given those two things. Okay, so no luck here. Um, I think those those tracks that I had seen was um, was from earlier today as they were just wandering around. But anyways, we're playing a very tough game of where's Wally out here in the bush trying to find the animals. And, well, David seems to be playing that game too. Yes, we've got a job to do, and the whole idea is keep looking, keep looking until luck strikes. We have done pretty well, I would say, since we started, and I've covered about 10% of the area I was thinking to look for Tingana, so I still got another 90% to go around, looking around, but in the meantime, I'm thinking if I don't get Tingana to wish him happy Father's Day, then I can concentrate on Tandi and her beautiful princess and this is one particular area that they love hanging out because it's not very far from where she was born so i want to spend some couple of uh, minutes here looking around before oops sorry yeah are you right fuck yeah, yeah. 
It just ran on a stick and I thought it was getting to Fug's way or his camera, but he survived. Yeah, I mean, uh, Kalalamba was born around this area, so it's not unusual for the mother to keep coming to the same area where she gave birth to, and we have seen Tani here a couple of times. Seeing some female nyalas here, I do not know what Fug you think, whether you're going to move forward or just stop there. Move forward. A bit more. All right, dear. I've seen lots of uh, female of animals today, from the wildebeest to the kudus we saw earlier. But now we got the nyalas. And it's always beautiful to see them getting the leaves or the bush willows before they all dry up or before the leaves are shedded down. And she's such a hard, and two of them are having a little go for each other. I'm not sure why they practice, but it's very typical for males, you know, unlike the females, which do not normally fight once in a while. It's very unusual. I don't remember the last time I saw two females fighting of any species, but males, like that young one there, most likely it was more of a play fight than an actual fight. Just too young to be fighting, and I'm sure the mother has put a bit of discipline all onto them. This should not happen, you're too young, but if you play fighting, that's okay. The thing you need to do is to keep eating. As the wind is picking up slowly, you can see from the grass how it's moving there. It's very typical, this hour round, we have seen wind picking up. Absolutely, I will do that. Let me know where to stop. Let me move forward. Okay, that's good. Fun. Okay, my foot off the brick. Sorry about that. Excellent. And Nyala is also just like the Kudu, so our browsers. I'll just scratch there. Trying to imagine they may needing some ox pickers if they have any ticks with them. They'll stop to eat. If the wind picks up very much, which doesn't auger very well with most of the antelopes, because the sense of hearing is a bit imbalanced, still very itchy on something there. Very good, Markham. And that's a good question. And you're asking, what does the word Nyala mean? And I think from the local people here, I think the Shangan, Nyala means onion. And I'll, con I'll confirm that with Lou in the final control. Could that be correct, Lou? Thank you very much. That was just a guess. I think I was taught that, you know, some months ago. And yeah, I mean, Nyala actually means onion. And what an interesting name. Oh, do they want to know why onion, you know, or do they look like onions? Or do they smell like onions? We have found animals, for example, the water bucks having a particular smell. Very good. And Lou from Final Control tells me it's because they tend to resemble the layers on onions. And I agree with you. And even look at them carefully from the stripes they got. Yes, they're just like, you know, the layers, especially when you peel the onion that we dig from the ground. Thank you very much, Lou. I do not know how the mist of the Nyala would, oops, something must have scoped them there. If any of one of them steps on a little stick and breaks it, and if they're not sure what might have happened, they'll always take off just thinking there's someone who is after them. And that's why they'll stop fast from eating and fast concentrate and find out what could be happening and either change direction immediately. But all looks good. So we've got two youngsters here, youngster females and youngster males. Not a big bulls like what we saw earlier. And you can see how the bush willows are being moved by the air as the wind is picking up. Fantastic. Very good, Nyalas. Keep enjoying yourself. Hopefully all will be safe as we move forward. All right. 
A beautiful girl is still searching. <laughs> Every time David says that. <laughs> I can't help but giggle. So we've seen, so far since you last saw us, we've seen one blacksmith lapwing. Hey, how exciting is that? We decided to move on from the blacksmith lapwing though, because we want to find something more amazing, even though they are really cool birds. We've just, we've been spending lots of time with them. And um, maybe we'll find some home. Oh, Nagama. You see it up top there? Let's see. Where are, where are you? I think it's a little bit higher. Uh, it's there. Ah, there we go. It was a tricky one to see though. Hello. They're so cool, these creatures, a blue-headed agama. Hello, they're so awesome. I haven't seen one in ages, like for a really, really, really long time. Uh, I enjoyed seeing the agamas. Um, coming down the main road in the Mara uh, with the bright red heads and purple bodies. Those were those were very special to sort of see, but very similar in sort of size. And uh, we do see these, of course, the tree agamas spending a lot of time on the trees. And that's the perfect spot, basking in the sun, catching the last of the, the golden glow. And what a perfect house that it has got there. Because it's a, it's a knobthorn tree, um, one that's not alive anymore, courtesy of the elephants as they've ring-barked it. But I also think that the termites have had something to do with it. I bet that they've started hollowing it out, which has now created the most amazing sort of cavities. And also the bark is quite thick and is peeling away, but hasn't quite uh, sort of disappeared. Not disappeared, fallen off. So look at that perfect hidey hole. That's awesome. Very nice to see. And that would, of course, provide a lot of protection um, from raptors and things like that. But something like a gymnogene, an African hawk eagle, would specialize in, in catching all sorts of critters living in between bark like that. So it's not safe from everybody. Also other snakes, I mean, they could be preyed on by a variety of different snakes out here too. But that was nice, that was quite cool to see. You know what we must do, Craig, please remind me, we, we're be just turning onto um, Weaver's Nest now, is that uh, we must check our tree for the bush babies where I think that they're living. Remember we had them in the top of the log the one night, so we must come and check that same tree. <coughs> Oh, I thought I was going to make it today, to this morning, without sneezing on safari. Goodness. Excuse me. Woo! Almost actually hit my face on the steering wheel. <laughs> it was a big sneeze. Um, <laughs> which tree was it now? I think it was a little bit still around the corner. It wasn't as close as I thought to that junction, I remember thinking. Okay. Wasn't any of these little trees. I think it was this one coming up to the left. Enjoy. Yes, I would imagine they'd be in the same family, um, with the agamas. Uh, they'd all just be, well, I suppose, slightly, slightly different. But yes, that some, some way or another, they'll be related. They're the same species. I don't think that they're a subspecies. There's just two different, Craig, there's, you know what there is though, there's a squirrel, oh, ah, it put its head back in as I pointed at it, there was a squirrel watching us from that hole that you've got in the, in the screen, it just had its head out, it was quite creepy actually the way it was just spying on us. If you zoom, you know, can you see that big hole? I think I can still see a little bit, I thought I saw its tail now. Oh, and Pradeep, the squirrel man, is actually watching, so... Maybe it'll poke its head out again. I think I may have given it a fright though. I pointed really quickly because I got so excited that there was something in the tree. Maybe what we're going to do today. We're just going to look inside the trees for all sorts of things. No, shy squirrel. Very, very shy squirrel. Anyways, there's one of these trees around here yeah, where, uh, where the bush babies were living. So we'll come in and have a look and check around here again. But that, of course, will have to be a little bit later this evening. It's still a bit too early for the uh, for the bush babies to come out. They like to come out at night, in case you don't know what, what we're talking about and why they aren't uh, around. Okie dokie. Right, perfect timing, because we're just about to uh, jump onto Gowry Main, where the road gets a little bit bumpy. So, off we go to Rolf. 
Well, everyone, as per usual, I'm out on bushwalk, and you know that I do like to get uh, up close and personal with um, the the different kinds of dung around. And so I want to ask of you uh, to tell me these three different dungs here. They look almost exactly the same, but just of varying sizes. Now, that first one over there, um, a very, very small, tiny little dung pellets, uh, getting a little bit bigger over here and ultimately uh, a little bit more sizable over there. So, who flung this dung? And I want to just try and show you a little bit relativity-wise how big it is. And those are quite hard little dung pellets. Um, now remember when these animals obviously do exhibit these little dung pellets, it's um, ruminants. So you wouldn't have a hindgut fermenter. And this one, very, very hard type of little dung pellets as well. So I'm actually needing to use my little pair of pliers to break it up. Very fine. So obviously from a small little um, antelope. And I want to know which one you might think that is. So, it, and I can't really see the particles on the inside there. So that's quite interesting. <laughs> uh, Larry, you say, let's get the scoop on the poop. Uh, absolutely. So we had that tiny little one. And with those little ones, um, there's a couple of different animals that you're probably going to be uh, leaning towards. And actually, one of them buries their dung. Um, so just give you an idea of where this one was found. This was not buried, and it was found a little bit in the thickets. Okay, so the next size up, that one a little bit bigger, and this one is a little bit fresher as well, but very, very similar on the inside. Looks like a little bit of a mixture, maybe some uh, leaves and grass in there. Not exactly sure. It's very, very small, and it's been very well chewed. Now, this was found a little bit out in the open, but near to some thickets. So that gives you an idea of this kind of um, uh, habitat. And um, it was also in a very big midden. So there was lots of dung around and lots of different um, uh, individuals you could see were using a common latrine site. Um, now, this last one, a little bit bigger, but this found completely on its own. And, well, as I say, a little bit bigger. And I'll probably find that there'll be bigger parts in there as well. There looks like a little bit of grass stalks, um, a little bit of fragments of leaves as well. And so we've got now three different size uh, dung pellets. But this is, you know, all part and parcel to tracking because it's one of the track and signs. You're not necessarily always just going to find tracks of animals. You can also just find signs of them. So... Uh, poo, obviously, being a major sign of an animal that's moved through an area and uh, maybe also where they've been frequenting and um, who, are they territorial or not, etc. Now, Zach, you say impala, kudu and giraffe. Um, Zach, I would say that two of those are correct. However, the numbering is wrong because um, <laughs> the numbering is wrong on that because uh, you've got two right, Impala and Kudu, but the numbering wrong. So let's uh, see what other ones you guys say. I'm not going to tell you exactly which one, um, but yes, as I say, these are rather small, medium sized there, and then a little bit more like rugby ball sized in shape. Okay, Justin, uh, you also got another two right, um, but you say scrub hair and um, uh, what was that, uh, Steenbok and I think Impala. So um, you've got one slash maybe two out of those. So, But that's great, guys. Thanks a lot for the attempt. Um, this over here... Now, what would it be, Steenbok or Dacre? Uh, one of them does bury their dung, okay? And which one is that, Herbie? Which one buries its dung? Steenbok buries its dung, so very easy. This one was not buried, so it's going to be our little common daker that would have uh, made those little ones there. The impala on a nice big midden, absolutely, that size there. And then this over here, number three, would be that from either Nyala or Kudu. 
Uh, Herbie and I couldn't decide between the two of them. They are very similar, are they, between Nyala and Kuru? But if I had to bet on it, I would probably go with Nyala. Uh, because I think kudu are slightly more cylindrical than these are almost boxy type shape. Anyway, that's the one lesson for us who flung dung this afternoon. Uh, so thanks for joining on that part of the afternoon bushwalk. We will be looking now if we can find any more signs of um, these beautiful cheetah cats. We're just going to check. Uh, we're now up by Sandy Patch. We're going to head towards Sydney's and we're going to go and see. Uh, hopefully these cats have returned. Good luck, Ruff, and hopefully you see those cheetahs for us. And it's always amazing to see those two cubs playing and full of energy, like, you know, last night and more so this morning. They give us a very, very good show. No luck yet with either Tingana or Tandi or any other leopard. Not even one single truck. But that doesn't mean uh, we are not doing well. What we've been seeing more are uh, Ellie's trucks, and we don't know where these Ellie's are. We shall be following them and this is the one moment you say anything that the bush will throw at you it's more than welcome and so when you're not thinking of one particular thing things just just showing up just want to back up a little bit and see if you can see some uh, uh go away but a little bit up there i don't know if the fog is too high if it's too high you let me know and we can move on it's, it's that's a good point and, and i'm not sure she's feeding on some seats there and that's the great go away bud Greg! Very good job, Fag. They've been known, known to feed on seeds, small little leaves. Obviously, not getting some seed from that particular tree. I don't know what type of tree that hasn't dried. I don't know that's. Those leaves are dried up. It's picking on some seeds there. Hello? Didn't you know we are here? Fag does a very good job. Thank you, Lou. And I'm just commenting on good job. Oops. But Fag does. Oh, didn't go very far. What could you be feeding on there? Unless you're feeding on uh, tamarits or anything that could be there. Then no. All right. Good job. That was good entertainment from the Goe Bat. You know, one of the best things I've loved from this Goe Bat is just to hear their call. Okay. He just went. Can you see the Very good job. Just try. And I know you are... Did he fly away? Okay. But either way, I still want to play with his call because it's one of the calls that I love. And let's see how that call will come out. I don't know who is being named in the camp now, like, Craig, Craig. All right. Thank you, Goy, but And even budding is something interesting. All righty. Fug, would you like a name or not yet? All right. You, you, you give me three choices of three animals that you love most, and then going to choose the name for you. Okay. My team player, Fag, <laughs> give me three and then the viewers will vote. Dog, I'm sure all of them know you. All the viewers know you. Say that again. Wild dog? Wild dog, honey badger. Yes. All right, viewers. Now, all of you, I'm sure, you know Fag and he does some great camera work. And I've asked him to give me three choices of animals or, you know, any, any animal of the three that you would want to keep a name for. And he has said honey badger, wild dogs, or a baboon. And baboon, we got two types of baboons. We got the olive baboon and we got the yellow baboon. Which baboon are you talking about, Fag? Okay, he says olive baboon. And for all of you, because you know Fag, so you want, as at one point, hashtag Safari Live and choose of those three names. What name do we give Fag? I have my name in my heart, so between wild dogs, 
the honey badgers or a uh, no leave baboon. So tweet to us, hashtag Safari Live, and from today we are going to officially give Fag a new name. Fag Alex Aka. Fag Alex AKA. And I'll be waiting. Alrighty. Okay. It's now time to look for the kitty cats. Time either to call them by name for them to come out. We'll be swinging at all the water points that we know, where they might come for a drink, or they might be hanging around there waiting for some prey to come for a drink. And let's find out what felines Taylor is looking for. I refuse. None. No cats. Serval, caracal, African wild cat. That's what we're going to be looking for. <laughs> but none of the big cats. They are annoying me because they just don't want me to see them. Anyways, I've got an update on the cheetah. They've been found. They're on the massive open area which in Simambili, which I assume is in front of the lodge, or at least quite close by to the lodge. So that's very nice. They're, they're there. So that's good. At least we know where they move. So they've, they've, yeah, they've been up and doing their thing today. So that's quite cool. Hopefully they'll be back soon. I, I like it when they hang around here. I'm, I'm happy if they're just to the west of us because at least we know they're close by and the possibility of a sighting is um, is, is sort of fairly good. I'm going to try and find my, uh, they, my no, they're not my elephants, I'm going to try and find the elephants that I uh, was looking at this morning. So I've just jumped on to Drakensberg South. I don't actually know why I came up here because I wanted to get to Inyala Road North. I don't know why I didn't go along Central. Ah, you know what, that's fine. We can just take Battelier Road. This will be perfect. This suits us just fine. We'll check here. I'm trying to think where they would have gone to. I haven't seen any elephant tracks crossing out on Cheetah Cut Line. I haven't seen any tracks crossing out on Gauri Cut Line, Gauri Main, sorry. Sort of around Twin Dams area. That's where I thought that they were going to head to, but nothing that side yet. So maybe around Mumba, maybe around... Yeah, I've sort of that side. I think I think Mumba Ledwood, so we'll go check them. Everyone's chatting on the radio. Sounds like it's a quiet drive for everybody. Edgar, it's a pity you've just joined on now because a little while ago I had an entire conversation about this. It often comes up, but the best superpower that a guide could have is talking to animals. And I'd like to see, let's, let's ask David, let's ask Ralph as well. Let's see what uh, what they think. Would it be to be able to talk to animals? In my opinion, I think that's going to be easy because then I could just ask everybody where, you know, if I see a giraffe, I can say, hey, buddy, how's it going? You know, where's, where's the leopards? Have you seen any today? And then he'll tell me. He'll just know straight away. Or I'll just sit and listen in to animals as they're having conversations. You imagine what these birds and squirrels and things all talk about. So I think that's going to be the most useful, but I'm sure super, like super sensitive eyesight would be amazing too, to be able to see in the dark, that'd be great. Or so, uh, really good hearing. And so all, the, all these things would be amazing. Yes. This is what we're looking for. Poop from the elephant. Right. Which way did they go? I'm just trying to see. It's very hard here, so it's hard to see where the toenail is, which is normally what you look for in an elephant track to tell you which way it's going. Craig, can you see on your side? Yeah, it's a bit sandy. That way, we need to turn around. We've made a mistake. Oh, here's a question from Louise. <laughs> uh, okay, we're just turning around because the elephant track's actually go that way and um, now Louise has asked me if I, if I could speak to the animals would they speak in accents I'm sure obviously can you imagine especially oh my best would be to talk to a European roller what accent would a European roller have oh my goodness it could have all sorts of different types of things that would be quite cool to hear to, yes, from France. I can't do accents very well. Craig can, though. Craig has a secret uh, hidden talent that he only shows us every now and then, and that's he can do accents really well. Craig, please, can you do... Please.
please, just one, just a European. You, you can just pretend you're a Sebastian because you do a good Sebastian impersonation. So what would a European roller say and how would it sound? Putting me on the spot, yeah. Yeah, that's everyone puts me on the spot all the time. Just one line, okay, Craig. You have to say, ah, oh, the caterpillars here in South Africa are much tastier than the ones in France. I don't know, but for, and that's not where Sebastian's from. He's from Gabon, but he has a French accent, so it's or a Gabonese accent, if you will. Come on, let's go, go, Craig. And now, <laughs> you can. Why not? Why he doesn't want to do it? <laughs> Come on, Craig. Come on, Craig. That's something we say all the time. <laughs> Literally, that's what Lou's just saying now. <laughs> You're not going to do it. I can't do accents. I really, I cannot. Unfortunately, you've seen, Craig has denied the challenge. I should have pulled out the friend card, but I think I left it in my other jacket. But it's, um, yeah, no, I... I, yeah, I can't. I unfortunately can't do accents. I think we tried. We had to YouTube, do a YouTube tutorial on how to speak like an Australian. That was funny. David and I did that one day <laughs> a little while ago. And uh, who remembers that drive? It was one evening. We did it for ages. I think we did the last hour of the show with an Australian accent. <laughs> uh, may have been on Australia. Well, I think it may have been Australia Day. So uh, that was funny. So last year. When is Australia Day? In January forgotten something saying the 14th of january but i could just be making that day up i actually don't know when australia day is oh the 24th it does have a four in it though okay well we're gonna try and convince craig to do a european roller french accent for us um let's see if david could do any accents of the different animals Well, and more accents. I'm not sure what Taylor is talking about, but yes, we'll always get my own. We had these impalas here, which are like a bachelor club, all males, young and old. It's a pretty fully grown one. You can see the twist of the horns there. And I'm sure he's digging some fobs or some plants there on the ground. Impalas being mixed feeders. And you can see the skin just twitching, as always a reflex. Sometimes on the flicking of the tail, when they think they got some either fly or a little bite, sometimes it's always nothing. And that's when the ox pickers come in very handy, when they come like scissors beaks to get all the ticks out. So the two other pairs of impalas of Isualia, they're having a little fight. That's maybe trying to mark his area territory. There are always so many uh, using the forehead skin. It's either a scratch or just leaving some scent behind. And you can see him just smelling to know that he has left something behind. The forehead is full of small little grunts and after he finishes to scent mark, you see him smelling? Maybe just to confirm, yes, he has left enough scent. Maybe of all the males around here, he could be the main one. And you can tell from his display, that's what they call a proud posture. The way he stands out there. We've got a bush there. Fuck, do me move forward a little bit? Or stay right there? Let's the yes. And we had some pigs somewhere. We're going to move on a little bit and see. Because you can see them at a different angle. And there's some pigs somewhere here. Taylor is asking me some very difficult question and I'll give her a very difficult answer in a few seconds that Eva could have, you know, the magic power as a guide. Right there? What, what power I could have? I hope that was the question, Lou. All right, and uh, sorry about my head there. I'm sure Fag is trying... Yeah, we, we the same area you're going, that's where they are. Keep going, well done. We have some pigs there. Yeah, good job. Good job. And just thinking about how to answer Taylor, if this magic power, I think what, what power, let me see, is if I could be able to bring different cuts 
and have a go on each other. I'm talking about lions and leopards. Have a fight, don't hurt each other or don't kill each other. And then have leopards and cheetahs do the same and then they go different ways. And then mainly then lastly have hyenas and lions going for each other and maybe having a giraffe as being a referee. That's what I'm thinking. If I would have magical powers, that's what personally I would want to do. Fox says that's a good idea, you know? Have a whole pride of lions with, say, three or four different, you know, male leopards and have a go on each other. Separate them after, you know, about 15 minutes. And then have cheetahs on one side and leopards. And then also have lions and hyenas just doing the same. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Fox says, like in the Animal Olympics. Do you want us to go close to those peaks there and find out if. Yeah, let's see if they stick around for us. Yeah. Are they gonna, you think they're going to be skittish, eh? Okay, let's see. They're always very skittish, the warthogs, but there's a small little group, a family here, that is hanging around with the impalas. Again, safety in numbers. I'm going to sneak on them very quietly. And I can see one fact, you want me to stop there. And three of them, it's like a mother and some two piglets. And there they are, not very far from impalas. Project Alpha, how are you? And always wonderful to hear your name. You think the referees will be the zebras? Exactly, because they're already dressed nicely in black and white. Very good, very good. And Project Alpha would want to ask you, do you think the officiating would be very fair? Uh, Project Alpha, would you think, Project Alpha, I want to pose a question for you. If would give the zebras as the match officials, of, if we don't count the zebra now, which animal do you think would be the best match official which would not favor? You have always heard of match fixing, you know, in World Cups or Champion Leagues, and sometimes the referees have been compromised and have been involved in uh, match fixing. Project Alpha, of all the animals you know in Africa, which one do you think, two questions here, it's gonna be twofold question, which one do you think would be very easy to compromise, and which one do you think would be a no-nonsense referee that will always be fair to either team. So which one do you think? Which animal do you think would be compromised? <laughs> and Lou from the Final Control says cheetahs would be very easy to compromise. You have to explain, you have to convince me why cheetahs would be easy to compromise. As you can see that warthog they are eating, like kneeling down. And <laughs> is exactly what I expected Lou to say and she is saying because cheetahs are cheetahs and they'll cheat and I think you got a point there and you know what changing the spots and it will not change it to spots thank you fuck I don't know what you think about all cheetahs yes what about leopards maybe but project alpha uh, Lou from the final control have said cheetahs would be easily compromised Please let me know what you think could be a no-nonsense referee against a referee, just like the cheetah to be easily compromised. An owl, because an owl moved the eyes or moves the head nicely, 360 maybe? Well, Fag thinks owls could make very good referees and no-nonsense referees because he thinks they're very wise birds. Well, we'll be waiting to hear from Project Alpha and maybe any other viewer who may want to join in this. Well, f nice viewers, we got the final score now and we think from today, Fag gets Wild Dogs and Wild Dog has scored 61% on the poll on Twitter. So Fag, Fag Alex aka Wild Dogs, are you happy with that? Oh yeah. All right, you could hear Fag in the background saying, oh yes. And from now, if you forget calling Fag and it's a Wild Dogs, please just know I'll be referring to my brother from another mother by the name of Fag, but from now it's Wild Dog Fag, WD. <laughs> WD40 says, WD40 Akafag, fantastic. You can see that particular is a drummer that just flew on top of that warthog there. And this one can 
easily get its food. Why they'll always be seen sometimes kneeling down is to give them some good leverage to be able to use their top mandibles to uproot any, you know, rhizomes or any roots they want. But if comfortably they can do that without kneeling down, they'll just keep eating. But once in a while, we'll see them going to their kneels. I'm not sure that one's trying to sniff that young female or what he's exactly doing behind her instead of eating. Well, you never know. She flicks her tail and keeps going. <laughs> Larry, you don't agree with an owl because they don't give a hoot. Why don't you agree with an owl? Give me any, Larry. Please join, join and let me know of the two. Which one do you think could be easily compromised and which one do you think then? Okay, let's rule out the owl for now. Which one do you think could be easily... Well, Fag, WD40, Wild Dog still thinks plays the Hooter. And yeah, Larry, let me know who do you think could be a no nonsense referee. So this one now has gone down on sneeze. <laughs> Project Alpha, well done, well done, Project Alpha. I'm with you 100%. Elephants, fantastic memories, and you can tell they don't forget very easily. They'll always have the rules of the game in their mind, if not in their pockets. Well, Project Alpha, I agree with you. And the cats sometimes could be a bit sneaky. You've seen cats when they hunt, how they behave. Project Alpha, we'll wait to hear what other more viewers will say, but I agree with you. Elephants, to me, are always no nonsense. You've seen how they behave when they're not happy. And when they're happy, they're just very easy to get along with. Yeah, Fag, what do you think? Project Alpha says elephants. Uh, elephants are a good, good call. Plus, they've already got their own whistle or trumpet. Oh, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, Fag says so. And when they're upset, you hear them, you know, making the trumpet call. And that's like a referee when you get one player playing funny and making a foul. How he goes, you know, with the whistle and the players trying to surround the referee. And he says, get out, get out of here. Otherwise, i going to give a red card. All right, this warthog continues eating on the ground, and Raf is also like this warthog looking on the ground. Well, everyone, we've just found a little plant, and it looks um, suspiciously like uh, wild cotton. Now, I'm not 100% sure, but I am almost certain that it is. Now, that's just some of the, the sort of pod that we've opened up. But let's show you the plant in its entirety over here. This is where it seems these little pods have been opening up. And you can see on the outside, there's the pod with the very uh, cotton wool type inside. And obviously here is one of the little pods before they open up. And that's quite interesting indeed. And I'm pretty sure you would be able to use this to as almost a form of cotton wool. It's almost identical in... in um, in texture as well. Now I hear you guys talking about superpowers of what we, what you would need. I think if I had to have superpowers out here, I'd like to be able to fly, just like a, even like a hornbill, just so that I could get up when uh, when we're close to an animal or when we hear rasping from an uh, from a leopard, just to be able to get up and very quickly be able to see them. So that's what I would like to be able to do. It would make my life so much easier, knowing what I know and how we track animals, etc. But um, this, back to this little plant, also quite indicative here. It looks like it's got palmate, palmate leaves. So, because I was showing you also some other leaves. This is also compound. It's a compound leaf, as that entire thing is one leaf. But... Um, well, you can see it's got like five points to it, and so we call that a palmate leaf. Um, so quite indicative as well. I'm pretty sure this is wild cotton, but I may be mistaken. Herbie's saying uh, he thinks so too. So let's go with that. Quite interesting, hey? Nice little plant that we're finding around here in the winter months, also showing its, its um, cotton, and it feels like quite a lot of seeds inside that cotton as well. So I think that's how they disperse it. Um, but I don't know too much about it. You see, as we're walking here as well, lots of these herbs, or the wild basil, 
um, and very nice to rub in your hands. They're all seeding now at the moment. Mmm, wow, that's very nice. It's got an awesome smell to it, and uh, one of the little wild herbs that we do have around at the moment, also uh, in the winter months. So, we're just looking at all the little things that we get around here in the winter months because um, it seems like the chase for the cheetahs is now ended. And so what we're doing is we're heading back towards Galago Pan because it sounds like there were some alarm calls around lunchtime. Once again, in a similar area where Tundi's been hanging around. So whether or not she's returned there uh, remains to be seen, but it's about that time for her to start moving. If it's her, otherwise it might also be Tingana, who knows, but uh, we heading for that little drainage line just between our camp and Galago Pan and we'll see if she started to move him or her and um, hopefully we get to follow up and try and find a leopard that's what we're hoping for but as I say always stopping for all these little things in between um, and looking for the interesting stuff now around this time of year you don't, know, don't see these little things in the in the summer months you see here there's a nice example of of um, what tree is this? Looks like a buffalo thorn. Yeah, it is. It's a Zizifus mucronata. But that's obviously been broken off by an elephant, and he's been rolling that around in his mouth, turning that, turning that, and almost grinding this off with his molars as he turns it in his mouth. And then, so he's after that. That's exactly what he's after. It's probably quite tasty, especially now in the winter months. This is what the elephants start doing. And a very good reason um, why you start finding their dung uh, very red in color like this. Um, because it's that inner cambium, that inner, the inner bark on the branch, which gets that red color. See there? And so uh, very similar to that of porcupine. They also get that red color to their dung. And a lot to do with that inner bark or cambium of um, lots of branches and big trees. So, yeah, that's it. Let's carry on going, heading down towards Galago Pan, and see if we can pick up on any signs of these leopards. I think we're going to join you in the area. Let's see, there's a couple of birds here. The barbets are probably going to be the most well-behaved, so we can maybe try and have a look at them. But, um, no, where are they going? Come back! Uh, of course, this is, like I said, this is my luck. With the animals this week it's getting old come on animals be kind but thank you Barb. But there we are just hopping around so we i think we're going to go and join ralph in the area because we are coming up to we tell it down we're just in the mulati and then i think we'll head around that way to have a little scratch nice little bird party so there were two crested barbets then there was a flock of or a gang should i say of arrow mark babblers there's another barbet over there Oh no, did they just drop down? They're feeding here. I'm trying to see who else we've got. I can hear chatters of other things too. They look like they're, again, they're on the sandpaper raisins. There might be a few fruits around. That's a tree that you can see with sort of the little green leaves on it. And we were watching a barber do that, um, even this morning, actually on Bushwalk. Very briefly, we had a, we had a crested barber really close to us. And it was investigating uh, on a sandpaper raisin. There it is again, looking for looking for things. I don't know if it's trying to get insects maybe. I mean I haven't really seen much fruit on the sandpaper raisins anymore. They seem to have all been finished but maybe if you search carefully there might be one that's a little bit sort of a late bloomer that will be a tasty snack for the barbet. Also this gives us an opportunity to listen out for any alarm calls. I think you can hear something snorting. I don't know where that is. Oh, I think it could have been, I think it may have been an impala. And there's still a couple of them are making the sort of gurgling noises, snortling sounds. Wait, let's see, we'll see if we can get the babblers. Uh, let's go a bit further forward because as they've jumped into a, a tree, maybe we'll get them in the next one. Yeah, we're all hopping. I know they're going to. 
Let me stop here. There's a few of them. They're just sort of bouncing around at the moment. I think it's just flown to the right. There they are. They're in, they're in that shrub just over there. Um, that way. Have you seen one there? I don't know if I see one that way. So this car doesn't stay in here. Um, so to the left and then down. There we go. They are. They're in, in there somewhere. I can just see them bouncing around every now and then. Can you hear them? They're there. See, there we go. You should see the wings sort of fluttering around. This is the kind of luck that I'm having. I'm very sorry. Hopefully, hopefully in the next few days, my my luck is going to change. I can't even show you birds properly. There's a couple. They're all bouncing around. There's someone has flown to the top of a of a tree. I don't know if you can see it through there. There we go. There is an arrow marked babbler finally, but it's a silhouetted version of an arrow marked babbler. Okay, well, we'll keep moving and head towards Gallego to help find out about uh, what's causing the stir. David has got a view of the sun. One of the best moments I love being out in the wilderness is what you see on your screen and it's just watching what wild dog was that your correct name fag oh yes. oh yes wild dog that's your new name very good not fag anymore just what he has set up for you there and what i've always thought is like a natural framing of a sunset and when you just sit somewhere and you watch the western horizon in the african wilderness life could not be better You always see the sun slowly going down and setting on the western horizon of all the beautiful colors you'd think of. It always marks the end of a great day. Very good. Bats flowing in front of it and losing the final control says that is beautiful and truly that's just wonderful. And we're just by the twin water hole area. Sorry about my head. And you can see the reflection of that tree in the water there. Just looks like a movie set. Very, very good job. Very good job, Wild Dog. The only thing we need to see there is maybe some lizards, uh, like, you know, monitor lizards swimming in the water. You see how the waves are changing the shapes of the tree, of the reflection of the tree there. Some fish, I think, could be breathing down there, either catfish or mudfish. You can see the bubbles coming up. So the only other thing could maybe want is to have a set with... Ellie's coming down for a drink. Excuse me. And just walking on the waterhole wall. As the sun slowly and surely setting and going down. What a view. Just isn't that fantastic. Couldn't be better, eh? Very good. We need to make a move. Wendy, you say you love that reflection, and I'm sure i going to show it to you again, Wendy. That's a great reflection, Wendy. And Wild Dog will show it to you again. Fag Aka Wild Dog, why don't you show it again? Don't, Wendy, don't look at my head. Just look at the reflection there. I'm sure my head doesn't make a very good uh, screen picture and Wendy if you can why don't you take that one as uh, your screensaver Wendy just look at that you're just spending a few 10-15 seconds of silence and it's not only me and Wild Dog here who are enjoying the sunset but we've got another team who are like wow what a sunset. Well, guys, come, 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 come. Because I want to show you something that if you don't know uh, what I was talking about earlier, with that very small dung that we had, we had, remember, a dacre dung, tiny little dung like that. 
We had Impala dung, which was medium-sized, and then a little bit bigger than that, uh, Nyala slash Kudu. Now, when we were dealing with the small little dung, remember I said there's two animals that have uh, very small little dung pellets like that, one being the Stienbok, but they bury it, and the other one being the Daika. And that one that we had on the road there was a Daika because it didn't have any um, signs of sand on it or anything like that. It was also out in the open when we found it. But what I'm showing you here is just where my stick is moving. It's on the inside of this. And if you look very closely, what you've actually seen here is a scrape there, a scrape there, and a scrape there, leaving this big pile of sand here. And if we just start to dig into the sand, look what we start to see. There's nice little, small little dung pellets. Now this is what the little Stienbock has done in an attempt to bury his dung. So he would do that, those scrapes with the front feet, and, well, he hasn't done an amazing job of it, but he has buried quite a bit of it, and I'm just exposing now a little bit as well. So there you can see the classic um, Stiernbock uh, bury site of their dung. So, um, well, if you have seen it before, it's, um, it's uh, always nice to see because I've seen this countless times, but it still amazes me how a little antelope can bury its dung. Why would they do that? Well, they don't particularly, it's obviously an evolutionary trait and, and, and a survival strategy, what, you know, not giving away uh, exactly where they move around because they do move around a very similar area all the time and obviously makes them very susceptible to predators. So if they bury their dung, maybe the predators, the little predators like caracal and even leopard um, and jackals, etc., um, would find it difficult for them to, to find their little routine. And so they have uh, thought of that strategy or moved along instinctively with that kind of strategy. And um, also, it looks like it's been digging here. The same animal, I would suggest, maybe for a little of these bulbous type plants. This looks like some kind of wild onion, I would think. Some kind of little anki, as we would say in Afrikaans, or a little wild onion, possibly. Um, but I think definitely just uh, getting down to those little rooty areas. And uh, the, some of the little antelopes can do that, Daika as well, um, and porcupines would obviously be ones that would definitely be going for lots of roots at the moment. And I, I think that there's a Stienbock moving around here quite regularly. And, well, we can see the signs. So that's it. Right. I think it's back time to move back down towards Galago Pan, see if Tandia Tungana are making an appearance. The sun is heading towards the horizon, so we don't have too long. Now, Christina, you say that's a lot of dung. Um, yes, the Steenbooks, they can go back and use the same spot quite a few times, and then they'll continue to bury it. Now, you see here, almost identical, a little bit of a slightly different color on it there, um, but this is nicely exposed. So that just literally, what are we, not even 20 meters away from that Steenbok uh, midden, here we've got a little daker. Uh, spot where they have been defecating on the surface. So very similar type habitat, um, very similar habits that these two creatures um, perform, but just a slightly different survival strategy um, in where they defecate and how they do it. So that's nice to note between Daker and Stienbock and the little antelope of this particular zone. There's some more over here. So it is also a Daker's little latrine area, I would say. There's another nice big pile there of uh, daker dung. So, yeah, very interesting and nice to see uh, the signs of these two little antelope moving in exactly the same area and probably, you know, fulfilling um, quite the same similar role in this area too. Now, Larry... Um, some of the predators, they will bury their dung. I think some of the smaller predators, um, 
You know, jackals, for instance, they don't bury their dung. They're very much like the mongoose, where they try and actually defecate on something that, um, uh, on, on like signposts and on elephant dung. They also do it on top of rhino middens. So, um, it, it, you know, the higher the dung site, um, the, almost the, the bigger the animal seems. They've got a little bit of uh, what I would say small man syndrome, um, because uh, mongoose do it as well. They'll try and back up onto a termite mound and try and defecate as high as possible, and then um, that would make them seem to be quite a lot bigger as well. So they do that, but I don't know of um, the caracal. I think the caracal also do defecate on the surface. Um, I don't know of any um, natural predators. Maybe maybe the little um, African wildcat, because that's been, uh, you know, sort of domesticated into our normal common domestic cat now. So the African wildcat, I think, might uh, scrape over its um, its uh, scat. But uh, there's not all of the predators will. A leopard, lion, um, hyenas, they defecate on the surface. Hyenas can do it in a particular spot sometimes. Um, but uh, leopard and lion, they definitely don't bury theirs. But, uh, well, speaking of lion and leopard, I'm still hoping that we're going to hear one very soon. Ralph, I'm counting on you this evening to hear a leopard soaring for me, and then I'm going to be in the area. Well, I am in the area now. I'm just approaching Gallego Pad, and an entire herd of elephants have moved through here at some point, but do you think that I can find them? No. <laughs> Uh, they've been going up and down. I think they may have gone to drink and then I think they came back sort of a similar way. So we'll just have a look around here. Maybe we'll go around and check. I don't know where we'll check. See, see, yeah, these tracks are going straight towards the pan. So here's Gallego Pan. Let's have a little listen. Of course, yeah, the babblers. What do you think, Craig? It's so quiet, except I think I heard an elephant. Maybe. Let's go see around here. It is very, it's deathly quiet. No soaring leopards, though. This is such a good spot at the moment for animals. They're all hanging around here. Please, elephant, just one. I think I was, they know I was so spoiled this morning and spent the majority of the walk with them on foot. That was such a cool sighting this morning, like it really was. And my, that's one of, I think that's going into the top 10 elephant encounters I've had on foot, definitely. I've had some crackers this year. Let's check. I wonder what that sound was that I heard. So listen again. Maybe this make the same sound. Mm -mm. That was very quiet. Not even any birds here. Yeah. You hear the babblers in the distance, you hear all sorts of things. Okay. Mm. I don't know where that thing was and what it was now. To me, that sounded like, I don't know if it was, like a, yeah, flapping against the elephant's body. And what else could be that sound? I don't see any elephant tracks this side though, but maybe they moved in here. Maybe we'll catch them going across quarantine tonight. Oh, how does silhouetted elephant sound? That sounds like a great idea. Now, if the animals can hear me, hopefully they can, hopefully they can be on the obliging side of things. I don't know. I haven't seen one leopard track. Oh, uh, other than some some old ones on Triple M. I think I've forgotten how to identify a leopard track too. It's been such a long time. 
Hmm, where did they go? Sneaky, sneaky, sneaky elephants. Okay, okay, let's keep checking up here for birds. And I mean, I don't know, hey? I think it's another question I'd also ask animals if they get bored. Do you know, I think gets bored. I wonder if the little elephants, well, the little, just the little elephants, but the young animals get bored. And uh, I suppose they want to just play all the time. And it must be frustrating for them when nobody really wants to play with them. But I don't, I don't know if they know, understand the concept of boredom. It's, um, it's very difficult to sort of say, I think, without verbally asking the animal and it responding appropriately. I mean, there might be some theories around it. Not that any that I've ever read, though. But again, there are many research papers out there. Especially out in the wild. I don't think wild animals would necessarily get bored. Maybe animals in captivity, confined spaces, aren't able to move a lot. They could probably get bored. But out here, I think everybody's so busy just focusing on making sure that they eat enough. Because remember, animals in captivity are, well, they've almost got set times as to when they get fed. They're guaranteed a meal every day or every second day, or I suppose it depends on the species, hey? So, uh, so it's a tough one, but out here, it's hard work. I mean, an elephant is basically gathering all day long, making sure it's got enough to eat, going to search for water. Same thing goes for a impala, a wildebeest. Of course, the animals that are ruminants, they need to make sure that they spend time uh, regurgitating and and then of course rechewing the cud so they've all got lots of things to do lions need to make sure that they've conserved enough energy so that they'll be able to successfully hunt down prey so no I don't think wild animals get bored they've got just too much on their on their plates very busy okay where are we gonna find some animals we're on open plains of quarantine now there's still nothing Trying to think what mammals I've seen today. I saw a warthog bottom, ran away. And then that's pretty much all I've really seen in terms of mammal life. Oh, one horn shawn, the impala. And a couple of vinyala hidden in the thickets here and there. Anyways, so I was at Treehouse Dam a little bit earlier and there was nothing but a blacksmith lapwing. Let's see what David has there. Yeah, Taylor, that's the, how game bros go, sometimes just by the draw of the game, and we are just watching beautiful setting ourselves. The sun has gone, and another beautiful reflection of trees in the waterhole where we are, the tree waterhole, and a thing with some uh, blacksmith lapwings in the background, and as usual, the blacksmith lapwings is just here on the very edge of the water, they rarely go into the water and they'll be feeding on any aquatic organisms they can reach, either on the surface, but occasionally also dipping their beaks right inside. And they very diversified on how they eat because they not only eat the aquatic organism, the water, but at times you see them way far away from the water and they'll be feeding also on terrestrial, uh, be they insect or something like that not necessarily water organisms, but more often than not, you'll see them, you can see how the reflection is showing one lapwing up, then going down, and then they're meeting in the water. Good job, uh, the wild dog. Excellent. Very monogamous lapwings are. And they'll always have the nest not far from the water. Ashley, thank you very much. Wild Dog is doing a fantastic job. And I think one of the reasons why he is overdoing or, you know, outdoing himself is just because of his new name. Ashley, yeah, he says absolutely. And Ashley, thank you very much. And he's so proud of his name. And maybe very soon we are going to start a process of having his names also changed on his passports. What do you think of that, Fag? Oh yeah, because that now will also increase yeah, your job rating in uh, Safari Live, and you know you'll become one of the best mm. camera operators around. Well done. All right, he says also operating a flight, and excellent. We're going to be making a move.
and find out what is still ahead of us. And well done, well dog, and excellent. Let's move forward and see what is waiting for us. We still got good time and good light to keep hunting. Crepuscular animals, it's good time for them not to be coming out. Anything that's always between dusk and dawn, this is the right hour for them to come out and either start stretching, start feeding, start moving around. Deborah, how are you today? And you're asking me what have I surprised, what have surprised me the most in Juma? And it's a very straightforward answer. The number of leopards I've seen here. I mean, I've been here now about two months and I've seen loads of leopards. And where I come from in East Africa, it might take us about a month to see one leopard. And here, Deborah, I would say it's every two, three days, leopard, leopard, every two, three days, leopard. And certain days, like yesterday, we had two leopards in one day, well, and not very far from each other. So Debra, leopards have been something pretty special for me. Something they're gonna remember when I go back to East Africa. And if I were to compare the two places, the huge difference between here and East Africa is the amount of game. When we see like thousand, for example, when the migration will come. So when I think of any big difference between here and East Africa, will be the amount of say, the wildebeest to we'll be seeing. But yes, I've seen loads of leopards here the last two months I've been here, and that has been very special for me. Deborah, have you been to Africa before? Do you plan to come and visit us one of the days and s go out with us on a safari? Let me know when you can as we move along. And as usual, keeping our eyes on the ground, on the very soft sand, this is what will always give away the cuts. When you pick up the trucks, you'll always know what direction to keep going as they keep going or turn around or look if they disappear to the right. You have your eyes focused there. So with your cameraman, you've got four eyes to look at. Did you spot something beautiful there? No, I was just showing where you were looking. Oh, thank you very much. Someone got a tall mammal at the moment. Sorry, Fug. <laughs> ah, we're dying here. We are dying. I can't kid you know, we have, we've got a giraffe. I'm going to sit and wait. And I have to park like 600 kilometers away from it because it just keeps running away. And then when I stopped, I thought he was going to carry on walking like he's doing now. But he then stopped and paused for a little bit behind the tree. Isn't that gorgeous, though? That's so lovely. I wonder if it's going to go for a drink at the pan. Maybe. That would be nice. Is the nest cam working? Imagine if a giraffe goes and drinks to get those sort of shots. That would be wonderful. But now he's hiding. Even a giraffe can be camouflaged. And it is a male. I'm telling you that because I'm looking at his ossicones and his, his rather large sort of very bumpy head that he has. Huh. He's now walking not quite towards us, but at least not going to be able to hide away in the distance. That's a very, very pretty scene. Now you can also get an idea of how tall some of the trees are. That is a dwarfed silver cluster leaf that he's just walking behind. Another silver cluster leaf destroyed by elephants. <laughs> Oh, look, a tree that's been pushed down. I wonder which animal did that. <laughs> that's quite gorgeous, though. Very sort of dark, contrasting trees with the yellow grass and the few bits of greenery here and there. Oh, stopping to have a nibble on guess. A silver cluster leaf. Nope, didn't like that one. We might get a silhouetted giraffe. That might work in our favor. So this is a very busy giraffe. He's moving around quite a bit. He's going to disappear behind a big marula. Well, we parked against a marula. I oh, know. Uh, of course. He's going to feed there now. Let me let me reposition us quickly. Make sure there's no more marulas that I can reverse into. Haha. -ha. We'll spy on him through this gap. No! Please! Please stand still. 
Because now I can't get you nice close... Well, Craig can't get you nice, close, intimate shots because he just doesn't want to see us. And he's not even looking at us. He's looking everywhere else but at us. He's obviously reacting to the car, so I'm giving him space. Please, giraffe, pause for like two seconds. He's eating now, nibbling on something. Again, it's, it's not... It's, we have to keep park quite far away. Ravinda, you're quite correct in saying what a, a sort of beautiful scene it was. It was it's, it was all very, very lovely. I like it when a giraffe walks in an open area and there are a few trees because you don't realize how tall the trees are. But you've seen us standing under them. I'm enjoying also the technique that the giraffe is using, which is the typical um, technique that giraffe used to eat, which is, of course, using those very long, tough tongues to wrap around a branch and simply just pull up and strip all the leaves off. And that tree is working very well because there's no thorns on there. So it's a, uh, a bush willow of sorts, maybe a little russet bush willow oh, variable. Sorry, I can't really see the leaves very well from here. Uh, russet. Looks like a russet bush willow. And uh, off it goes again. Going to camp now in the direction of camp. Very uh, indecisive. It's um, doing the zigzag motion. Perhaps it's learnt that because I think we try and zigzag towards giraffe all the time to try and get them to see what we are. I'm trying to get another view of him. Ah, oh, it's a pity now. There's there's no uh, there's no roads that cut in this side. It would have been great to get a silhouette shot. Anyways, this giraffe is walking back towards camp, and that's what Ralph is doing too. Well, yes, we have been walking back towards camp, but we're here at Galago Pan, which is right next to Galago Lodge. Now, remember, I did say that we're coming to find out whether Tundi or Tingana has been moving around here, because we did hear some alarm calls around lunchtime. And uh, it wasn't far from here that we saw her uh, a couple of nights ago, and she was moving around um, and uh, uh, right around the lodge. And it seems trying to hunt one of those little bushbuck or nyala that do like hanging around the lodge with the nice sprinklers and the lovely grass, etc., that's available for them. So Tandy, not stupid as well. She knows that that's where some easy food is to be gotten. But we haven't heard anything for now. And while it still remains a mystery if she's headed back this way or if she's headed up towards where Tlalamba is, they haven't been spotted today. So, well, we, I think we're going to have to wait until tomorrow now because... Um, it's getting a little bit late. As you can see, that sun is set, so it's not long, and we will be heading back towards camp um, as per usual uh, when you're out on foot. Once that sun hits the horizon, you want to be heading back to where your safe zone is. Um, and this is the time when the predators are going to start walking around as well. So that's one of the reasons why we also go to our safe spot and uh, take it uh, nice and easy. Now, it seems like Taylor's got something exciting to show you, and I'm going to say goodbye and see you tomorrow. Bye bye, Rolf. See you later. Um, now, we can play a game very quickly. Hashtag Safari Live. Let me know what bird do you think this is. It's a silhouette challenge. It's an easy one. I just want to see if everybody's still awake and paying attention. So, first one uh, to type what bird this is. You will not win a prize. But you, of course, get bragging rights that you won the silhouette bird challenge to date. Like I said, it's an easy one. It should You should be able to get that quite easy. Some birds are very, very easy to to guess. <laughs> Louise has given her a guess, but she doesn't count because she didn't use the hashtag Safari Live. Ha ha! Or the YouTube chat. Oh, we just wait quietly and awkwardly. I'm sort of silently. <laughs> oh, look, Craig, our giraffe is back. Hi, giraffe. Are you coming in to play the silhouette challenge as well? It's just walking across. It might be a beautiful view once again. Walking among some of the bigger trees. That's a big jackalberry. It's just passed. And then some more silver cluster leaves. Lots of silver cluster leaves here on this open area. They like the sandy soils. And then, of course, the rulers. But they're still taller than this giraffe, even if it were to stand on its back legs. These trees are massive here, really, really big. And just pausing, having a little look around. 
The giraffe is doing what we actually want it to do because in about 200 meters we could get a silhouette of it. Well done, Kathy, Giraffe, and Giraffe Girl, and Izzy, your guest, Lilac Breasted Roller. You win the prize of not winning a prize tonight because, you know, this is not the Ellen show, sadly. Anyways, <laughs> or Oprah Winfrey. Everybody look under your seats. You're getting one. You're getting one. That was always my favorite. Anyways, let's see. Come on. I'm not going to not going to let this giraffe get away from us we will we will be getting a silhouette shot of the giraffe so we just got to be patient he is about to cross the road i was telling you about we can go down it now just don't go down towards camp come back up this way please giraffe i'm also hanging around here because i want to see the honey badgers and the white-tailed mongoose and this crepuscular period sort of the last little bit of light is normally when they get active don't you dare giraffe Going around. Ferrari safari and meow. Okay, we're gonna win. Because before it was gonna get too low and then we were never gonna get the silhouette that I wanted. There's lots of trees in the way. No, there's too much. I'm trying to find the gap. Oh, maybe bush brush about where I can get around the trees, otherwise you're not gonna see the silhouette at all. It's a little bit it's not, I mean it's not great. But it will do. Oh, actually, maybe no. Maybe it is going to be nice. There's almost a silhouette of a giraffe. Still a little bit light. Perfect. Now, we still need to achieve our goal of... It is very beautiful. It looks like the sky is on fire behind the trees and they've all been burnt. But I'm still holding thumbs because there are some impala around. Maybe, just maybe, one afternoon we will get those impala bounding up and down. Remember, like I said, I've always wanted to see silhouetted impala leaping as high as they can leap, but I haven't found any impala. But if we take this bottom road all the way around, we probably actually, we're actually going to win the silhouette challenge today. I always liked taking silhouette pictures of animals. It's one of my favorite things. And it's not very common, but I think if we actually go all the way around, we might win and catch it again. And we're going quite low now, as you can see, we're sort of going downhill. And then that giraffe is going to be up a little bit higher. All the impala and wildebeest are on their way up to the open area. So if Tingana or somebody, the leopard or anything, comes walking around, maybe they'll chase them. Impala, would you like to go and bound and the sunset for us? Would you? One's running, but I don't think he's going to jump high enough. Nah, just you just get trotting. Trotting impala. Keep going that way. Like I said, we're still going to have a little bit of light for a while. We could achieve our goal. Ah, oh, there he is. Actually, he's, he's going to get into a much better spot now. It would have been nice if we could have timed it perfectly, of course, with a sunset. Oh, there is a herd of impala up here. Already. Another group. There will be lots and lots of impala. Lots and lots of food. Uh, Roberts, uh, yes, I also think they're quite gracious when they're, they're walking, when they run. It's quite nice. Okay, I'll stop here. And we can just appreciate the animals. There's lots of them now. Because we've got the impala again. Then maybe something frightens those impala and then they leap up and then I've achieved my goal. And it's so quiet. It's very nice. With this the pink hue in the sky. Very pretty. Stopping for a bit of a snack. The giraffe doesn't seem to be too interested in feeding though for long periods of time and of course the giraffe is going to do that. <laughs> Hiding behind the marula. Yeah, some Franklin shouting now. If a leopard soars, I'm going to find it. And I'm right here at camp. And I'm hoping 
Tengana will be out calling. I don't think he's been seen anywhere else, so the possibility is that he's still around here on the property somewhere. Okay, okay. Well, we'll carry on doing a couple of laps around and hoping to find a leopard. I think David's got a juvenile bird of sorts. All right, we got a raptor. I have not seen raptors the last three, four days. And I want us to have a small little ID. I want all of us to try and identify which bird of prey is this. Remember, as usual, look on the shape of the head, look on the colors. They don't look, you know, very, very clear. They're not very conspicuous. I'll only give you one hint. It's, uh, is it an immature? No, it's a juvenile. It's just turning from an immature to a juvenile bird of prey or to a juvenile, you know, raptor. So it's not immature per se, but look on the shape of the head. Look on the color of the beak and look on the breast and the wing feathers not very clear like a scut as the face down look at the eyes his you know the size and how she's looking and let's think or guess Ravinda, African hawk eagle, very good guess, a very good guess, but not quite Ravinda, but well done. But look at how the feathers are sticking behind her head, but well done Ravinda. And how are you doing Ravinda? It's always a pleasure to hear your name Ravinda. You said a great viewer. See the feathers sticking out of her head there. The color and see she got a hooked beak. It's just turned from immature to a juvenile, you know, kind of. One thing is certain, you know, she's an ego. Let's start from there. She's an ego. She's keep, you know, keeping looking. And one more hint, they take such a long time for them to get the plumage of fully grown adults before they get all the colors. Thomas, you see the snake eagle, not really, but very good, very good, very good guess. It's very similar to what you call a brown snake eagle, Thomas. It's very similar to a brown snake eagle, but not quite. So I give you all a very important hint. This is one eagle that takes such a long time, sometimes up to seven years, to reach an adult plumage, which is always some bright red on the face, black, white. Zach, very well done. Zach, very well done. You see, it's Batlia, no doubt about it. It's a juvenile Batlia. Well done, Zach. Excellent. And a big applause for you. Well done. Thank you so very much. So you'd imagine if you'd see a fully grown uh, Batlia ego, how it looks. And that's, to me, a juvenile one, because once they are from small chicks, they go to immature, and then from there, they go to juveniles i'll try and see whether i can get my book and fog will tell me how good the light will be for us okay. yeah keep enjoying that as and try and get the egos and i'll show you how an adult looks like all righty taking your time beautiful eh? and you can imagine how the fully grown different it will be to the immature ones. So I want to get it. C D E E S. Alrighty. Alrighty. Thank you very much, Hakuna Matatalu. And I just want to show you. Uh, Fagi, let me know where they have some good light there. And. Is that good there? Yeah? And see what you just saw there and what I'm going to show you here. This is the very top, number one. Excellent. Very good job. And that is the Bachelor Ego. And very well done, Zach. Well done. You got right. And what we're just watching now is that one there to the right. The JC. Is good angle there? Still down a bit. Yeah. Still down a bit. That way? 
Very good. Thank you, Fag. Thank you, Wild Dog. And what you see on the right, the JC now, that's the juvenile. J for juvenile. And the one to the left would be, I would say, the, you know, the immature. Now look at the fully grown ones. That are number one there. And you see the colors they got. And from the JC there to the number one, it takes seven years to attain those colors, eh? I'm not sure I know of any other eagle that takes such a long time to get to those colors. Why it takes so many years, I have no idea. And I would be more than happy to know why it takes so long. And if you look carefully, I can show you that there is the female. And you can always tell the female from the male. And I think the juvenile one there was a female. And you will always tell from the outer covers there that are white. And you always joke and say they are like wearing petticoats. When you remember way back, you know, girls like in the village, would, you know, would wear petticoats. And we'll always say the or white skirt. That's how you tell from the field a male from a female. Fantastic, eh? For me, that's a good question, and you're asking, you know, when do they become independent? That particular one there, as we move on, I think it might take a... Okay, Louis, sorry. Okay, bring your question again, Louis, sorry. All right. I would guess, Louise, you want to know when do uh, the Batleyers become independent from the parents? Will I know this for sure? I would say it would take maybe the same time as long as they also take, you know, to get the plumage. It also takes a long time for them to get independent, maybe a couple of years. But I can get to the exact answer later tonight, Lou. But I would also be happy to know. But what I know for a fact is they take such a long time, or the seven years I said, to get to that plumage. Fuck, how does the moon look? Does it look very good or is it too far? Yeah, I'll be more than happy if you could somebody a look. And it looks better than last night. We saw it yesterday, but I think today it looks more colorful. How is that? Beautiful sky. Thank you very much. Yeah, looking the final control says beautiful. We're always very lucky in Africa. Our sunrises are always fantastic. The sunsets are always great. But now look at that crescent of the moon. And now all the, excuse me, all the crespular animals, crepuscular animals should be coming out. It's a very good tilt of day and night. They should be out ready to either come feeding. Very good job, Fag who do not want to see that with such a clear sky, not cloud. When we started the game drive earlier, in the morning, we thought it would rain. The clouds were building. It was a bit gray. And in the afternoon, we were debating, do we put our roofs on or not? But then just found out it just cleared and it got better. All right, very good. Fuck, do you think it's time to look for the night animals now? What do you think? Yega, good question. Does the full moon affect the animal's behavior? We saw, for example, during the writing season about a month and a month and a half ago, April and May, when the impalas were writing, they started writing between the first sight of the full moon and they stopped at the end of the full moon. And it's always very difficult to see uh, impalas, you know, uh, mating because they'll always mate at night, you know, in the moonlight. So it depends on what you're looking at. But we have found out sometimes some cats like lions or leopards will take advantage of such moon or when the moon is full and it's bright enough and they can see. They still see a little bit better than the antelopes or than the prey. So yes, Yaga, it affects their behavior and they tend to move most of the cats for hunting. What I've always known, there's times way back when we had issues with poachers, we used to have what we call the uh, the poachers moon, and the poachers will always come out at night and do the poaching. But then, luckily now we have very good game rangers, and that has since been contained. I might be wrong, uh, Frank, but I'm trying to look through some bushes here, and you might tell me 
whether it's a buffalo I am seeing from a distance and you allow me when you can uh, when you come back to me we'll move a little bit forward and we'll just look you see that opening there I'll move forward a bit and we we'll just confirm what it is let me just move forward a bit I could be seeing a bush and I'm saying I'm seeing a buffalo you never know you know with all this with the new name I gave you let's find out something dark I'm not sure it's moving or not but it looks like a buffalo but let's turn that direction and see do you see there Fag? okay let me get a little closer looks to be like a lone buffalo which I'm sure Raf would not have wanted to see on foot how is that stop there move forward a little bit back all right no no worries Fag. that's good that looks like a buffalo there and I would be wrong but I would say 99% chances it is a male buffalo yes now that confirms did you hear me all righty and look at how he's looking at us very mean and we have now just gone to infrared thank you very much Fag. and look at him how mean they are always these are not the animals you play about with and very easily they can just bring you down without a warning hello mr buffalo you have a good life living with females and youngsters and one time you're on your own when you're shown the door and that's for that reason they become very grumpy and i was talking about how hippos are pretty dangerous in the village they come from but apart from the hippos buffaloes also cause a lot of damage Kathy, good question. What will all the grazers do for food when the grass dies? And most of them now, what they'll start doing, they'll start digging, you know, the grass dies on top, but below it, the tubers or the roots are still holding lots of food, but the stem is not of much value. So they tend to dig, those are like animals like, you know, buffaloes or zebras, which are like bulk grazers, they tend to dig what would be found in the uh, you know, underground. But other animals, for example, elephants, we have seen elephants are very clever. They will knock trees down and, you know, get the roots down. But also we have see them getting the twigs or the branches and thus keep rolling them in the mouth and eating the bark of the trees. Alrighty. And then once the rains come around August, all will be good. joy excellent very good to see you know buffaloes again and hopefully they'll bring the lions back yes that will be exciting and i'm sure you know a week ago we had a uh, buffalo that was brought down by the nukumas so it's a blessing to have the buffaloes back and maybe the lions will come again we'll have one more quick look on this buffalo before we move on all righty We'll just have one more quick look on that buffalo who just come a little bit closer and he's just staring at us and as you want to leave him alone he doesn't charge to us we'll be going across to the beautiful Taylor McCurry <laughs> Lou fed in there oh so smooth he is David is quite smooth isn't he uh, we might bump into our giraffe friend again because we've seen his tracks around here. He came walking in this direction. Maybe he's already at Gallego Pan having a little bit of a drink. But we're driving very slowly and it's getting really cold. I made a mistake of not bringing my big jacket out or a scarf tonight. I actually don't know what I was thinking. I normally don't ever leave without a scarf, but today I did. So I thought we'd just take it easy here. This area for nocturnal creatures from civets that do like to feed in sort of drainage lines to honey badgers who spend a fair amount of time moving through those areas. And then bush babies will be nice. I'm going to check in some of the holes in the trees, Janets. All these wonderful things. So let's see if we're gonna be in luck tonight and manage to find any, hopefully. It would be idea ideal. I can hear a few bats too very sort of high-pitched chirpy noise that they do make so they're flying around 
it'll be very difficult to try and predict that on camera. It's not impossible, but it's definitely one of the more challenging things. And especially when there's just one zipping around. Sometimes when there, there's a bit of a feeding frenzy going on. I'm actually surprised we don't see more bats at Chitwa Dam because bats love to eat mosquitoes. And often in the evenings, or for the last few evenings, when you go there, there's this massive mosquitoes swarming above your head. So I can't believe we don't see the bats. Maybe a little bit later in the evening. Perhaps I, I've always been at the dam a bit too early for them. Okay, we're about to arrive at Gallego Pan again. Louise just said that sometimes there's a bat that gets stuck in our bathroom. So I've never seen that one before. I have yet to see that bat. Okay, let's just have a quick look here. Just check. No. <laughs> Louise just told me that uh, Alicia, who also works with us, and uh, she's an American, and uh, she, <laughs> she apparently woke Lou up very early in the morning once because the bat was in there and she was too scared to go in. <laughs> I would have loved to have seen that. That would have been very, very funny. Oh yeah, we're going to see how Emma and Jenna behave, well not behave, react to the interesting creatures that venture on into uh, the DRC. I wonder who will scream louder when they encounter the first, their first um, experience with a solifuge or a uh, sun spider, red roman. You've got a variety of different names. Those things that look like spiders but aren't spiders, but they're quite creepy. They're always really funny when they come racing into your room. There's nothing, there's nothing slow moving about a, about a red roman either or a solifuge. And uh, what else? The centipede, because we get some monster centipedes that come through. Or when they see the big mumba, or I think, is it a mum? No, it's Mozambique spinning cobra that's li living under the Wendy house. When that comes out every now and then, it doesn't cause us any hassles. It just lives there to, be, to get nice and warm, of course. So we will see. We will see who screams the loudest. So I'll, I'll get back, back to you on that. Ah, oh, very nice. I don't know how David has been so lucky today with all the, the mammals because he's got another one that's quite shy. Well, sometimes, as I said, is you know the lack of the draw or what the bush throws out. You turn the right corner and something red comes up. And now we've got a steenbok after having seen a huge male buffalo. We are seeing a small little antelope and this is a steenbok. Always very shy and Unlike, you know, buffaloes you might see in a herd, three, four, five, even if they're old males, these small little guys here will always be on their own. Hello, Steinbock. And I've admired seeing them because of their size. It's only that it's a bit dark now, but one of the best things I love them for are the ears, how they look very painted, rather dark to see now, and he's slowly making his way in the bushes. To see two, and there's a male and a female, hello, or a mother and a youngster, but all is very solitary. Browse us again, feeding on little leaves, or when you see them on the ground, they'll be digging for some food. And they tend to be active like now, before it gets a little darker, and they know the security might be at risk, and then they slow down and just stay somewhere for the night. They always have the barrows or warrants where they make them and then they establish some territories and very unusual to see males and females overlapping and you'll see a male just living next to a female and they will not come into contact for any one reason they don't even wave at each other until when it comes to mating time you'll see the male sneaking to the female how does that sound Fag? yeah a typical males Fag, wild dog, wild dog says very unusual. I'm not sure in my next life I would want to be a steinbok. Uh, Ian, thank you very much. Uh, David is more whisper. I think it had been more of a combination of luck, a bit of skill, but the person who brought the difference, I think, is Fag. And as soon as I gave Fag his new name, Luck has been following us, even where we're going. What do you think, Fag? You're too kind, David. So all up to your skills, I think. Oh, no, F Fag, I think, uh, you know, and, and also, uh, it happens, Fag. 
<laughs> Fagas very good. Oh yeah. Oh, and he always have very great eyes, Fag. And yeah, so lights back again. Thank you, Steinbock. And I was saying earlier, I'm not sure in my next life I'd want to be a Steinbock, just living on your own, you know? It's a bit difficult, eh? When you don't associate or relate with someone only during, you know, when you're meeting after that, you're living your own life, eh? Fag, would you like to be a, a Steinbock? You want to stick with the wild dog, eh? Yeah. Very good. Okay. Fog stays with wild dog, and I don't think he would want to be a Steinbock. Very lonely. I don't know what they spend the day thinking. <laughs> All right. Fog is still thinking, wow. Well, keep to the wild dog, and that will be more or less like it. It's just shining my light on the bushes to chance maybe on a chameleon or a bush maybe jumping up and down. This is always a very good time to spot these primates coming out. You always see the red eyes in the bushes or scrub hairs. All right, hopefully I'm still good there. Night is where are you on the road? Fantastic. I had gone in a small drainage there and I lost that would lose my signal, but so far, so good. Let's go to Taylor and see whether she's seeing anything in the dark or not. Nah, not yet. We're gonna go. What is that sound? I don't know, there's something rattling in this car and I can't figure out what it is. Anyway, so I'm going to try and block it out. Ah, I believe somebody thought it was a cell phone that was ringing. Might be my flask. No? Nope. Let's see if that works. It's stopped for now. We'll see when we go over a bumpy area we normally hear. No, it was not a cell phone. I don't even know what my ringtone is. My phone lives on silent these days. Craig, do you know what your ringtone is? Also, Craig's is not sure. We're so used to having our phones on silent pretty much all the time. I barely, I barely, barely take it out of, out of silent. Right. Please, can we see a civet this evening? I haven't seen a civet in such a long time. It's really been ages. So that could be quite cool. So I'm trying to drive these, these obviously these roads that run along the Mulwati River system for owls and all sorts of wonderful things. <laughs> oh, this is an interesting one from Andy about which which guy do the wild does the wildlife troll the most? Um, Andy, well, it depends. They like to play the disappearing hideaway game for me, or don't stand still or fly away. That's the game they play with me with James. They like to play the game of let's use the luxury facilities all the time. Every time he sees an animal, they either start urinating or defecating, which is standing joke around camp which is quite funny all the time it happens to him um and then i don't really know how the wildlife plagues anybody else but i don't know it goes through stages where sometimes it's really good sometimes it's not so good what are all those little eyes in here let me just quickly check i don't know if it is anything It'd be a good area to see something though could be maybe a little jennet moving in and out of these thickets let's check I mean, if I were one of the nocturnal creatures, we'd probably be here. Oh, lovely Laurie, I wish your dream came true. The fact that you dreamt that I found a honey badger, I wish. Maybe that's going to happen tonight. I'd be very excited if that were the case. Yeah, I don't know. We have, we're have very short on sort of nocturnal creatures up here. We know that they're here. We just don't ever get to see them. It's bizarre. It's totally bizarre. We used to see so much down south. Porcupines, honey badgers, eating in all the rhino middens all the time. Seeing lots of white-tailed mongoose. We've got incredible sightings of white-tailed mongoose in the Mara. I even had a white-tailed mongoose scavenging on a wildebeest carcass, which was bizarre. That was so cool. 
I mean, obviously, we know a lot of animals are opportunistic feeders, but it was the first time I'd ever seen a white-tailed mongoose, like, physically, um, well, I suppose, feeding on the meat. It was so amazing. Um, so that was, that was nice, definitely. Got lots and lots of sightings there. And even a freaking wildcat in the Mara too, and lots down in the southern Sabi Hassan. But anyway, it's a nocturnal critter that is very common, but we've been uh, yet to find. But of course, David, the animal finder, has got it. Well, another luck here with a scrub hair, very common in this area, a nocturnal animal definitely looking for food and they may be feeding almost the whole night. Do they smell good? Dry? Not palatable? What do you want? You should dig something from the ground. Scrub hairs, maybe there. Excuse me, until she is convinced what she wants and the right quality. Always coming out at night. As again, as I said, they may feed the, you know, through the night, going back early morning, keeping away from the predators. One of the reasons they'll come out at night is hopefully they're not seen or spotted by the would-be predators, and more so, say cheetahs or leopards. But still, once in a while, they're brought down. Huge ears they got. They need to hear very well, and of course, you can see the big eyes. Are you trying to charge us? So where, where are you going? Still not very happy with what is on the menu. She keeps smelling, she keeps moving until she be convinced what's good for her. I'm not sure that's the best way to look for food. They normally eat, yeah, she's got something nice at least to enjoy there. Either some leaves of some kind from that fob. Most of them having dried up, maybe that's the challenge she is facing. Not sure exactly what to look for, but normally they will dig rhizomes. Linda, you say they are so cute, but oh, don't worry, don't worry, fuck, but they're great leopard snacks. Yes, they are so cute, but I can tell you, we have seen leopards going for them, eh? and anything cool, you know, cool, 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 any, any protein, Linda, for a leopard, including that scrub here, Leopards will go for them as much as they are cute, and you feel sorry for them when you see, you know, leopards going for them. All right, hopefully, we're going to see more on the way, or we might even see something bigger. All right, my spotlight on again. All good, fuck. All right, see some eyes on the road from a distance. Maybe it's another one. I don't know what that is. Oh, it's a stand box. Let's get a little closer. Little stand box, fuck. Oops. Oh. What's that frog? Stenbok, eh? And maybe a younger one than what you saw before. There were two of them. Hello, Stenbok. We've just seen some Stenboks before. And this one is just walking the grass there. Want to cross the road. Hello there. See the ears I was talking about before. If you look in the ears, like someone came with a paint or with a feather and painted those ears, I have always admired. All right, Taylor got something more interesting. No, I don't think more interesting, just cool. I like the bush babies. Here we have a bush baby sitting very, very still. Look how long its tail is. That's crazy. No, it's a little bit away from us, which I think is why it's, it is so relaxed. I'm going to put the light on it just a little bit, just to help get a bit more sort of detail there, because it's just so far away. And Craig seems to think this is the same spot where you had an amazing sighting of a bush baby. Craig, who were you with? He says, Craig says he thinks it was Ralph. Very nice. That was a couple of evenings ago, wasn't it? It's just sitting there. It's very relaxed. That's a rock, so I got excited. I took the spotlight away. I thought I saw a mouse or a gerbil, but uh, it wasn't. Now, it amazes me how sometimes we get lucky, and they just sit very, very still like this. I give you an opportunity to, of course, get a little screenshot. 
Very nice. And look at their tails. Their tails almost double the length of their entire body. It looks like it's not even looking at us. It's focusing at something else. Maybe it's seen an insect or something moving around on a branch. And it's going to pounce towards it. Is that the case? All those who are going to winter, they tend to feed on a lot more gum of trees, the lesser galagos, because there, well, there aren't so many insects around as we've clearly seen. See how it keeps focusing. So it's obviously just sitting there waiting for an opportunity for a moth to maybe fly by or reach out and grab it, or a katydid to land on a perch on one of these branches. There are a couple of little insects flying around that you can see the light catches every now and then, but um, not a super substantial meal for a galago. I think they prefer to eat some bigger insects rather than catching something the size of, the size of a midge, like eating a raisin. Very cool. That's really, really awesome. Okay, what we're going to do, you know, we, let's take a gamble here. Let's drive a little bit further forward. We've had a nice sighting. Let's see if we can get another view in the last few seconds of the show. I'm going to try and roll in. Now I'm going to try and find it again. It was here. Nah. No, I don't know where it is very difficult to see where it was. Sorry, I'm just scanning around. Oh, maybe that wasn't the best idea. Oh well, it was still quite cool, don't you think? I think so. It was a nice long sighting of a um, bush baby in comparison to what we normally see. Oh no, we get the final countdown. Anyways, hope you enjoyed the safari. Hopefully the cats will come out to play tomorrow morning. But have a great day and we'll see you all on the sunrise.